get out of here, do we? What are y'all doing in here? We're smoking reefer. And you don't want no part of this shit. You're smoking reefers? Yeah, of course we are. Can't you smell it? No, Sam. I can't. Come on, Dewey. Join the party. No, Dewey. You don't want this. Get out of here. You know what? I don't want no hangover. I can't get no hangover. It doesn't give you a hangover. Well, I get addicted to it or something? It's not habit forming. Okay, well, I don't know. I don't want to overdose on it. You can't OD on it. It's not going to make me want to have sex, is it? It makes sex even better. Sounds kind of expensive. It's the cheapest drug there is. Hmm. You don't want it. I think I kind of want it. <laughs> okay, but just this once. Come on in. Ladies, gentlemen, and motherfucking racist spaces in between. Yo, this is your mother loving boy, Dirty Dick Spick, the pale crumb catcher. They call that motherfucking soul bopple again with another episode of the I'm Black, He's Mexican podcast, that aka IBHM oh podcast. And as of late, the soul bopple incognito podcast, that aka, and you know I love to say it. The Spick Podcast with another week of fuckery, debauchery, hope, and IDGAFs. Oh, what a week it has been. Uh, down from just the change in altitude to just the fucking showing of cards that motherfuckers are putting on the table. Um, and I'll just get right into it. From, what's his name, something Nazir, the Fondelman doctor and the gymnastics, even... Jeffersonville High School senior uh, Michael Begin Jr., who was 18, now charged 24 counts of child molestation to police say he had inappropriately touched 17 children ages 3 to 8 while working as a teacher's assistant at the Thomas Jefferson Elementary School at the YMCA in Jefferson, Indiana. And there's shit like this that I just, I don't know. And not even to want to wanna label the shit into a fetish because it, it obviously is something to where in pornography nowadays there's software that these people run uh, through. I'm just I'm talking about the actual literal video of you know, these people fucking to de age people, women specifically, so they look younger. And obviously, the younger, the more better, the kangaroo sweater, they try to get 18-year-olds and barely legal joints. And of course, they'll lie and they'll say it's a teen shit, but they literally have like some kind of CGI programming that makes them look even littler, tinier, make the dicks look even bigger, more gigantic. It's, it's, it, it, I don't get it. I don't, I don't see how that's appealing and it looking of course it's definitely not for me but i just i just wonder to myself and i want to go right into like some entertainment shit maybe i'll just i'll, I'll fluctuate too back and forth because i don't know if y'all heard just i mean speaking of the illness that is uh you know child p biography um dude from glee uh and i swear i did not try to make that rhyme whatsoever uh, what's his name? Trying to pull up his information right here. Something Scally. Um, if I could find his information. Come on, motherfucker. Don't fuck with me. Mark Sailing, I guess is his name. I totally fucked that one wrong. He uh, was recently found this past week. Motherfucking floating down a riverbed after being hit with um, child pornography charges. Like, And I'm talking about he like pled guilty. He was found like with the hard drive some flash drives i'm guessing even cds maybe some printed pictures I, I don't know exactly how much shit they had on him but it was in the thousands as far as still images and then videos go and i'm not too sure and what source of the deep web uh, the deep dark web does someone have to you know go into to be able to find this shit or to pass this thing on, I, I can't tell if if this was like you know amateurly made by um, uh, I don't know what you know. See, I don't know how motherfuckers get their hands on this shit, but he definitely did. He then got caught up, and I wish I, I could have found out more how that could have happened. But uh, yeah, he just he got convicted. He was gonna do 
I don't know how many years since, but once you're marked with that, that's like the ultimate scarlet letter. Like, you really fucked up a creek, and that's probably why he outed himself and floated down one. So, I mean, this kind of goes into a long line of just people saying, fuck it. Because uh, even his homie, uh, or not homie, but a fellow castmate from Glee, I forget what his name is, he was the more blonder one. Or more whiter one. I mean, they're both Caucasian. I don't know how to say, but uh, yeah, he had come in. So I think, but I think that was off of OD, OD, and so. But I know there was close. I know that there was pals, and, and I don't know how much, uh, how deeper the rabbit hole goes uh, when it comes to that. But that's just, it's just some. Um, I don't know. Like it's, it's uh, it, it it's fucked. It's. I mean, you definitely deserve. You know, what I'm saying an ass open of sorts, which. Going back to the original dude who kind of, you know, has been getting the most attention as far as, like, molestation and shit goes outside of, you know, your typical e-Hollywood, you know, uh, sexual misconduct, uh, motherfucking, um, that that Nazir guy, uh, Larry, he was sentenced, they got his ass, I mean, after so many testimonies, after so many just back and forth, they, they just straight up said, all right, you're convicted, 97 years to maybe two life sentences. I mean, they give this outrageous number because the guy's definitely not going to survive. But to show how much, you know, how 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 far down they're going to, you know, uh, you know, put their foot uh, into this sort of situation. Rightfully so. Uh, there was a dad, and I don't have the article link here, but I'm pretty sure y'all probably had, had seen this, uh, to where he, his two of his three daughters who were there testifying were molested by this guy. And he was so angry, so fucking pumped up and full of just, I mean, uh, well-suited hatred that uh, he tried to hop over, like, the three podiums or whatever uh, because he was trying to, like, he want, he was asking the judge, as if the fucking judge is going to let him, but asking the judge, you know, just give me five minutes with the guy locked up, you know, saying we'll settle this straight. They said no. He goes, all I want is one minute with him. They said, obviously no. Uh, so he said, fuck it. He jumped over three, you know, whatever little things to try to get to him. I think he might have gotten to, like, a lawyer or something, but they fucking tackled his ass down real quick. And they didn't hesitate in doing so. They didn't hesitate sicking six motherfuckers on this one guy, even though he wasn't resisting, and doing all the typical things that they got to do in order to restrain someone and to make sure that they don't, are not a harm to anyone else or to themselves. So they locked that shit on tight. And I didn't think, you know, that was going to you know, ever be an issue, but, I mean, apparently he was really hocked up on adrenaline. I was thinking maybe, I mean, how the fuck does he not see how far this guy is? But, again, when you're so enraged, so just, like, fucking nothing nor time or space can ever come in between where you feel you and your objective are. Uh, and, again, he got damn near real close, but they smashed his ass real quick, and then, of course, people... I were wanting to label him a hero for, you know, for, you know, for doing that, which, of course, again, he had the opportunity. He went for it, knowing damn well they could charge your ass. But in, in the same ticket, you're dealing with some, uh, some sort of fucking demon uh, and people can see. So, I mean, with that, I mean, they didn't charge him, luckily. Uh, but I was just like, man, like, there's just so much shit from this. And, I mean, I'm pretty sure that Nazir guy, he's going to get his when he gets into the fucking pen. But it kind of does break my heart when we see other young talents who kind of go down that route, so to speak, whether or not by indulging in the activity themselves, then, you know, by playing the role of fantasy, which is kind of where I'm like, well, where do we draw the line? Because if you're not doing any harm, but you have this sickness or this weakness, you know, but you're at the very cusp of things, you know, I don't like, you know, I, I, I don't know uh, how to rate that or where where that bar would be at or what someone can do who would need help can even try to come out to because you're already labeled, you're already sick, you're already demented, you're already an unfuckwittable uh, sort of speak, and then if you were to, again, indulge in any sort of way, whether that even would be, and, you know, I'm tempting to, I don't I mean, mind you, porn is there for us to be able to enjoy, to be able to have to our heart's content, to be able to fucking knock one out, rub one out, and then hopefully have clear, a be of clear mind. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I've never, I don't know what happens if that just doesn't do it for you. And does that in fact, then it make you want to go prey upon and find something and, and do it in real life? Like, is that not just, I mean, I know once I fucking go online, find my little shits and, you know what I'm saying? Handle business. Like I'm, I'm pretty much done. I, I close out the internet browser, might even 
shut down the computer. I, I, I might just call it a day if I don't got shit else to do. So, again, I don't know how that goes for them. But, I mean, obviously, I mean, there's no escaping something of that nature. So he kind of, I mean, had to do what he felt had to be done. And one thing that kind of uh, upset me was that in this past, and mind you, no one's perfect. No one can be led with anything, no matter what you practice or what you believe is going to save you unless, you know, of course, you face your demons and, and do what needs to be done. Who knows whether that would have been him or if he would have made that, met that, because, I mean, only it's the best between him and God. But I get upset that after his passing, some lady was, uh, I guess some, someone too was a part of his uh, bird-watching crew a few years back when he first moved down to Hollywood, um, said he was a devout Christian. And again, that wouldn't mean nothing if you have a sickness and that, or you have um, fucking uh, a fetish or whatever that is. So, I mean, that, that shouldn't bother so much, but I'm just like, man... Like, I don't know. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to have to put one, put one telly mark on, you know, uh, for the fuckboys of Christianity, but it is what it is. All right, so from fuckboys, you might have fuckboys to a cuckoo cracker killer from Charlotte, North Carolina. A uh, passenger was actually on a flight taken into custody after landing into Charlotte, North Carolina. Her name was Charlene uh, Sarian Harriet age 36. Now, she was aboard an American Airlines flight from Dallas, Fort Worth to Charlotte, and as the flight had begun to descend, Harriet, who was seated at the rear of the plane, you know what I'm saying, for those that are on CPT, that's what they give you, uh, she reportedly ran from her seat towards the cockpit. Now, flight attendants who had taken their seats when uh, Harriet had bolted from the last row had ordered her to stop. And when Harriet did not, the flight attendants had to chase her down the aisles. Now, the crew apparently had restrained her with duct tape and zip ties in the first class section of the plane, making all the white folks feel real uncomfortable. Uh, but apparently, like, as they were trying to restrain her, this bitch fucking bit off some fingers. Not that she bit them off, but she bit some fingers. And um, ain't no fucking reason as to why she might have... Um, done what she done uh, no motive at all um, all I could think of is that this was in honor of Black History Month for as racist as that shit sounded uh, let's play guest to racy on this next story a woman trying to bring an emotional support peacock on a United Air flight and it reveals that there's a growing crisis with fucking this airlines now United Airlines flight again had denied a woman's attempt to bring a peacock onto the flight here and according to a travel blog the woman said the peacock was an emotional support animal allowed to free fly or allowed to fly free and while the woman had offered to pay for the peacock's ticket the blog said united would not let the animal onto the flight and according to a live and let's fly the woman said the peacock again was an emotional support animal and that it was to be by her side at all times. Uh, but again, according to uh, United, the animal did not meet the guidelines for a number of reasons, including weight and size. Uh, and of course, that they want you to provide documentation to the medical professional that, you know, would state this is a support animal and at least 48 advance hour uh, notice. And again, I just think it's so ridiculous when I see motherfuckers with, with their animals. I think I see one with the pig ones. And I'm like, okay, this shit's just for fucking shits and giggles now. This is just to make a mockery of the situation. Because um, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm being uh, without heart because I myself cannot see how the fuck they even help to begin with. I mean, I know that they take animals to, like, children's hospitals and cancer wards where every motherfucker is going to die so they should enjoy a pet at least once in their life. Like, I could see and understand that portion, but because you're too goddamn nervous to wait in line at a fucking Costco to pay for your bulk items, I, I don't fucking understand that part. I don't understand it whatsoever. So, again, for all my folks that might have been a little uh, thawed uh, with the idea of the black woman running up the plane in honor of uh, some kind of black history statement um, this lady was in fact a white lady and they would not release her name but I'm pretty goddamn sure don't be mad at me white people I love y'all alright but from peacocks to just cocks cocksuckers in general that's what I'm talking about our president head celebrity and chief and staff uh, we had uh, 
what is it called? The State of the Union, the very first State of the Union speech that, if you weren't aware, happens every year after the uh, president in uh, seat has uh, completed his first year of office. And it was super fucking long. I'm not too sure if y'all watched it. I tried to. I had to uh, pretty much just kind of read the summary notes on it because it was so... Uh, yeah, and, and if you're gay, don't be offended by what I'm about to say here because if you love sucking dick, God bless you. But it was such a cocksuck show. It just seemed ridiculous to where... And I love how he had uh, Pence t- to his uh, right and he had Speaker of the House, Ron, Ron Paul, or Paul Ryan, I forget what the fuck his name is, to his left. And they both looked so proud. Like, they, they like as if they studied uh, Joe Biden and his, you know what I'm saying, bromance affair with Obama and kind of just followed with that same shit. And they, they would not only applaud for everything he said, which is understandable, but sometimes they even give the motherfucking standing ovations way too often. In fact, it almost seemed like they kind of slipped the everyone a little something, something, because everyone was just way too enthusiastic with some of the shit. Either that or just to show you who is sitting on what side of the fence. And it would be so funny when they deadpan to the motherfuckers that either Trump is either mentioning low key or talking about directly. It just, it, it was a kind of a circus show. And you can definitely see the left and the right. You could tell the differences in between. And even the ones that were on on a non-side, like, for example, some of the military, like you just tell, look, he gave these orders. I'm following these orders. That's what the fuck I'm doing. Expect no more. Get no less. And, oh, man, it was just ridiculous. So, I mean, there's a couple of little takeaways um, that I want to go over because definitely it was all about America first. And how could it not? Uh, bipartisanship just ain't happening. Uh, it, is, it did sound like it was a, like a motif or like a, a set of greatest hits on, you know, all the shit that he's done. And, and usually it's a 50-50 of what, you know, you said you were going to do, what you did do, what you plan on doing. It was 80% of him talking about all the shit he's done before, like barely 20% of what he expects to do. Uh, his biggest takeaway, the biggest cheers is just how he was like the Obama eraser, which again, just fucked with all the progress that we thought we made in those eight years. Um, also, it was so dramatic. And mind you, I wouldn't expect anything less from a motherfucker from reality TV, a, a person who knows how to sell his brand. Yo, the stagecraft was fucking top notch. From all the stories that were boohoo's and and and, and <laughs> God, even the ones where it was the minority who who now works for works for them. He had his token black guy that he made fucking stand up when all the other motherfuckers just you know kind of nodded their heads and did whatever. Like the stories were just crazy and what and, and that's what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to connect with you. And he figured out each demographic and gave you a sliver of it. Like, God damn, I tilt my head, not because I, I love the man, but because I respect that he's given exactly what the fuck you would want. And if you were able to sit through it, you were able to take that away from it. But again, it was a fucking shit show to say the least. And everyone fucking left there will fucking come on their goddamn lips. <laughs> you know? So speaking of motherfucking white privilege, um, a Tennessee mayor by the name of Megan Barry had revealed that she had an extramarital affair with the police officer who let her security detail. Now, uh, Tennessee reporter Joey Garrison spoke with Barry before she issued a statement about the affair. And it pretty much kind of got, like, right to the point. Like, I'm not sure if they knew each other or if he just had the ability to do research or the fact that it was such a big rumor that it just became a thing that she had to address. But one of the things about it that kind of caught me was that she was married. She is married. Uh, she obviously been cheating on her man uh, with this head of, her head of security. I'm pretty sure he gave her head quite a few times. I'd imagine, um, you know, and, and it kind of, not to say that it makes sense because when you're in a workplace, you're with some, you're with these people, uh, the better part of the day, majority of life, sort of speak, because you, because you only sleep so many fucking hours. It feels like you're at work or getting to work more than anything else than actually being with your fucking friends and loved ones. Um, until again, they then become your friends and, and loved ones. 
And uh, the biggest thing, I guess, from from the interview or what they then later on try to allude to was that, you know, how many times does she go on vacation? How many times in these vacations does she have security detail? How many times, if and we're, long story short, where all the fucking times did he go along with her? Now, main reason for that is because she, by law, apparently is 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 needed to bring some kind of security detail. I mean, the fact that it was fucking why would didn't she bring his ass because she trusts him she feels secure and obviously you know, they was doing things um but i like how they're trying to he was kind of more again trying to hit the facts like how much of the taxpayers money was paying for your fucking affair and the way she kind of answered the shit she was just ready you don't come public unless you're ready to fucking attack and be at all guards uh but the one thing that she didn't really kind of get into and again you kind of it gets into the point to where it is personal information is about how how is the relationship now between your man. She said it, it is a pri- our privacy, so we like to keep that private. It's like okay, and when I asked about what's up with dude, I mean it's not like he was got fucking fired or something, uh, saying that they don't communicate. But I'm saying, but you being, you know, having that for so long, like does that shit just go away? And uh, mind you, if it was something that bring you some shame that got you some trouble of course i'd imagine you wouldn't just want to fucking continue talking but i am curious about that i feel like all that led me to want to know if it was still going on the fact that she didn't answer that's kind of like well then shit that's all that's all i wanted to know that's the only thing that got my fucking attention how do you waste my time but i love that when the the reporter would ask her well are you going to you know resign she's like no she's like are you going to take any 10 miles she's like no she's like i made it she's like this is a mistake uh I, she felt bad i guess because the, the people didn't know of it and she's a worker of the people so she's just i guess was just kind of giving us a heads up just say look i'm a business as usual i ain't gonna take no days off it doesn't require it and in a way i'm just like oh, okay well if it was anyone else though and I don't know if this is right or wrong, but if it was a man to get caught up, wouldn't we expect him to resign? So is this, again, one of those? I know a, a lot between us fellas and ladies, it's it's all uh, sexism, uh, definitely um, stereotype. I'm, I'm forgetting the word that I'm, that I'm trying to use here. Um, but it is, you know, one-dimensional, so... Uh, or fuck what's the word I got a double darn standard. it I can't believe that I'm forgetting this shit but why uh, or how do we view this any differently does she get a free pass because of that because I'm one of the fellas that is doing the dirt I don't know hopefully y'all can tell me sound off in the comments y'all so from the fucking mayor cheating to you just chief Keef chiefing I don't know how the fuck I would say that, but San Francisco apparently is going to be retroactively applying California's new marijuana legalization laws to prior convictions, expunging or even reducing misdemeanors and felonies dating back to 1975. Holy hot damn, nearly 5,000 felony marijuana convictions are going to be reviewed recalled and resentenced and more than 3,000 misdemeanors that were sentenced prior to Proposition 64's passage will be dismissed and sealed according to uh, District Attorney George Cassillon who says the move will clear people's records of crimes uh, that can be barriers to employment and housing. Ain't this a beautiful treat. San Francisco move could also be bringing, uh, be the beginning, I should say, of a larger movement to address old pot convictions, though it's still far from clear how many other counties will follow the famously uh, liberal city's lead. This shit is very mad exciting, and, and especially for those that were just fucked with ah, goddamn possession you know what i'm saying like it, it's your own damn fault if you got hit with fucking intent to sell because your ass was fucking trying to you know nickel and dime your way up, up the food chain uh so to speak but even then it's just so goddamn petty some petty pendergrass pussy pussy popping uh pinochle bullshit and i don't know what the fuck i, I meant by saying all that shit but it's just uh, it's such a big move and it's and it was one of those things i think a lot of people we're worried about, especially because, you know, the, the jail systems, prison systems, they make so much fucking money. 
like I still get mad and I hate so much with the passion our local law enforcement. And then it doesn't mean I don't respect them. It doesn't mean I don't salute them every time I see them because I, I always give them a deuce. So I always give them a salute. And and for the most part, they'll kind of give me the same love back, especially when driving, which hopefully doesn't get my ass being pulled over. But just just me showing love regardless. This motherfucker. And I probably talked about this before, but I just can't not mention it because I just hate that I was just a fucking statistic like a goddamn name your favorite hood rat at your local um, government cheese line. Um, but I was, again, a quarter mile from the crib, homie on passenger side, lit, drunk, what have you. Just It was on it. And apparently I might have swerved a little bit. Obviously, he got some fucking attention. He pulled me over. Turns out that I was drunk by the slightest degree. In Arizona, I think our legal limit is .08. I think I was at a .02. Didn't have enough sense to argue, to fight. They told me it was pointless. Of course, they're not going to give me some fucking lawyer if I don't have the fucking knowledge. And that's on myself because they earn money from getting fucks like myself and those really pushing it. And and again, I, I was I definitely was in there by a slice of the degree. Uh, just you know, easy pickings for a motherfucker trying to meet his quota. And uh, and verse can tell you even more about the what worst prejudices. Uh, but it's just it's just some bullshit. And I'm so glad that for those that just that been hit with some bullshit that finally have a fucking lever to relieve themselves with. And, and the fucking prisons are overcrowded as it is. I mean, I can understand wanting to make a statement. I can understand wanting to prove a point. But for, for I don't want to say unconstitutional, but for things that obviously are no harm or now un- illegal, then get the fuck to step in. Yo, know, as much as I get mad that, um, you know, liberal states, you know, will make such a fucking hussy fuss about a fucking business that you know, doesn't want to sell to a certain dem- demographic, that's on them. That's on them. You know what I'm saying? If they want to fucking look like bigots, that's on them. If they want to lose out of money, that's on them. You know, I really, I got to hand it to these motherfuckers. And as much as, you know, uh, and I, I don't know how I'm throwing gays into this, but it's, maybe just because San Fran is considered a fucking big old gay ass sta- uh, city, I laugh and side note here that uh people were actually going up against amazon or the gays whoever their the leader is was going at amazon telling them like there's like nine cities you just can't fucking put your you know second headquarters in because of them you know being uh said bigots and motherfuckers there's, there's no business out there in san francisco too fucking expensive why the fuck would they want to go there uh but yeah i don't know why the fuck i mentioned that shit salute marijuana affects the brain Speaking, uh, freeing some black folks, um, I, and I definitely will play guest to race on this one, but a New York City teacher is under fire after she reportedly singled out black students and told them to lie on the floor during the lesson on U.S. slavery. Oh, yes, the teacher identified as Patricia Cummings uh, from middle school 118 in the Bronx uh, then allegedly stepped on the back of at least one black student to show her what slavery felt like. Cummings pulled the stunt during multiple 7th grade social study classes and it just became fucking apparent to most out there, according to uh, my people's at the New York Daily News. And it was a suppose it was a lesson about slavery and the triangle trade, as well was told by uh, one of our coming students. And she said, the teacher had instructed three black students to lay on the floor in front of the class. And then she said, you see how it is to be a slave? Do you do you know how do you see how it feels? And one of the students had commented saying, well, I'm fine. The uh, teacher, Miss Cummings, stepped on this bitch and she put her foot on her back and said, how does it feel? The student said, see how it feels to be a slave? Fuck. Another student said the, the quote unquote lesson was followed uh, by showing a video of slaves being beaten, tortured and then thrown over the side of a ship. The students told the Daily News that Cummings measured the length and width of the students on the floor to show how little space slaves had in the ship. If that ain't fucking strange, that's just goddamn near retarded. And 
really fucking disturbing that of all, I mean, obviously, again, this is a Black History Month. You want to be able to tell them all the nitty and gritty, and it's just funny how the uh, uh, the prominent um, greater race uh, loves to just remind motherfuckers where they came from. And mind you, we as a people, no matter what race you are, should know exactly where we came from so that we know not to find ourselves in that sort of situation again, but also to appreciate that we're hopefully not there. And if we still are, then it's up to you to make that tide turn. But goddamn, if it ain't a bitch that they have to be talking about slavery on Black History Month. I might just happen a few weeks ago, but I'm tying this into now. But still, it all makes purpose with this fucking episode. And the fact that he's going to step on these motherfuckers' backs. Like, really, bitch? How privileged is you that you can step on these motherfuckers' backs just to make them feel, bitch, as if you felt that kind of shit? And again, I mean, not to get all fucking Rachel Dolezal in this bitch and fucking get all, uh, you know, on, in, in the culture, but... I uh, fuck. <laughs> Where's my resident black person that so I can speak to y'all and, and, and get y'all's opinion? Because, I mean, I'm pretty sure I don't take this in any kind of light way. Right? I'm just surprised that you didn't get fucking Sean Quita saying, fuck you, Miss White bitch. Yo, speaking of fuck yous and salutations, for the third time this year, there's been uh, execution up in Texas. This time uh, with lethal injection. I guess they've all been lethal injections. I don't think they fucking line motherfuckers up and let them rip. Uh, But there was a former uh, Dallas accountant who was condemned for fatally shooting his two young daughters while their mother listened helplessly on the fucking phone. And he finally got put to death. Now, uh, John David Bag- Bagaglia, B-A-T-T-A-G-L-I-A, uh, he was executed uh, for the May 2001 killings again of his nine-year-old uh, daughter, Faith, and six-year-old sister, Liberty, which is just some really fuck names to have to be connected with uh, murder at such a young age. But anyways, this motherfucker was smiling at his mother of his slain children, Miss Mary Jean Parley, Parley, and the other witnesses to his execution, um, when they walked into the chamber viewing area, and when the warden asked if he had any final statements, he said no. And then he changed his mind and says, well, hi, Mary Jane. And then looking, smiling at his fucking ex-wife, he says, I'll see y'all later. Bye. And then a few laters later, he, I guess they had injected him, and he goes, am I still alive? And then he just, not too fucking far uh, later, he goes, oh, I feel it. And then I guess he grasped twice and then he started to snore. And that was it. Like, it almost seemed like too sweet of a fucking death for a man who obviously they presume, you know, has gone crazy in some sort of way. He was, you know, put you know, behind bars um, and given multiple studies, but they never really released what could have been. Uh, but one of the fuck things that happened from this, from from what they recall, in the when he was calling his wife, uh, he was in the background. Uh, one of the daughters, the daughter Faith, saying, "No, Daddy, please don't do it." Just before he just fucking let her up with some gunshots, and it has to be, you know, kind of like a, a bittersweet thing to kind of witness it because I mean, it's one thing. Look, he's locked up; he can't hurt no one else. But it's almost like, fuck, why does he deserve to live? Why does he deserve to get half breath? Why does he deserve to be fucking fed on the daily and allowed to recess to go out and fucking play? Uh, but, you know, the things that you can't help yourself, the things that you can't do, even though no matter how hard you try in doing so, because you got to do your best before you can expect anyone else to help. Do what you got to do and then let God. All right, so speaking to the situations where you really can't do a damn thing, uh, other than to, of course, leave it up to God and the judicial system. Uh, but a Wisconsin judge has sentenced the second of the two teenage girls who were accused of the 2014 attempted homicide of their friend by stabbing her in the woods to please the fictional character known as Slender Man. Now, Miss Morgan Geyser, now 15, was sentenced to 40 years under a mental health institution supervision. Now, while she may periodically petition to release, uh, to get released from the hospital in the future, she will be under institutional supervision for that time. 
And she was quoted and saying, I just want to, you know, to I want to let Bella and her family know that I'm sorry. And she broke into tears. She said, I never meant for this to happen. Hope that she's doing well. And Bella's nickname, uh, Geyser, had given the victim, Peyton Lautner, uh, when they were younger. Now, the way this shit had popped off, Geyser and Anissa Weir, uh, W-E-I-E-R, they're arrested back May 31st, 2014, after attacking Lautner with a knife and leaving her behind. Uh, why, why shoot, uh, what, Wakisha, why, Okisha, W A U K E S H A, was the name of the woods, and all three girls were about 12 years old at the time. Now, Lautner was stabbed 19 times, but was still able to crawl into a nearby road where a passing bicyclist stopped to help. Now, again, 15, she survived her life threatening injuries, uh, but no rule further word as to how she's doing has been going on. Now, prosecutors have said that both Geyser and Weir were obsessed with Slenderman, again, a character often depicted in fan fiction online as a horror figure who stalks children. Now, during the sentencing hearing, both prosecutors and Geyser's defense attorneys called on mental health professionals who have evaluated Geyser to testify, and psychologist Dr. Brooke Londonbum and psychiatrist Dr. Keith Robbins both testified that Geyser has made progress in her mental health treatment, but London Mom, uh, who was court appointed, testified that Geyser was still hearing voices near the time of the 2000 uh, October 2017 evaluation. Now, uh, as we reported in, in saying that she had last heard an auditory hallucination uh, that she calls Maggie. Uh, just before weeks of, of, of being contacted, Geyser's attorneys also called on Jesse Andrews, the director of forensic services at the uh, Winnebago Mental Health or Winnebago. How the fuck you say It's a mental institution where Geyser now lives. And Andrews had testified that Geyser does not present uh, with psychotic symptoms at the time, uh, but um, is being told that they're going to be held as adults the mental care facility and uh, she definitely is one of the youngest patients in the living unit she goes um, on to say that she would estimate that it was august or september of last year that uh, her psychotic symptoms were gone so again uh, and i'm not too sure how well you can fake the system or how or what they can see but they're asking for the maximum sentencing of 40 years again under institutional supervision I mean, that's her whole fucking lifetime. Now, as of December of last year, Weir, who is now 16, was sentenced to 25 years under a mental health institution supervision after uh, a jury had found her not guilty by raising a mental disease or defect after she had pleaded guilty to second-degree attempted intentional homicide. So she was party to a crime, and for that, that's why she got less time. Now, guys who had pleaded guilty last year uh, attempted uh, two attempted uh, first-degree intentional homicide, party to a crime. However, she agreed to a plea deal with prosecutors in which the court has found her not guilty by reason again a mental disease or defect, despite her guilty plea. So, it's kind of fucked. Um, she's giving that kind of leeway, but they're they're asking to take into consideration everything. Uh, that they had, you know, endured and declined, uh, or in the signing of the sentence, you know, it's gonna, I don't know, fuck, with I, I'm, I'm, t I'm done with this shit, because it just, it's upsetting, it's so stupid, and, you know, all, it, it almost seems like the catch-all fucking, and, and mind you, please believe, don't get it twisted, I know mental health is a, is a bitch, it's a thing, it's, and, you know, it's a disease, it's something that sometimes you can't cure, so you just might end off and cut off completely, and, but, oh, holy hot damn, it just, I, I'm, I'm just more curious now as to if we're ever going to hear from the girl who was intended to be dead, you know, I wonder how she is as far as, like, functionally, I wonder what she's planning on doing. I wonder if any bit of that evil had leaked into her. I mean, she's... I mean, I'm so happy that she was able to survive. I don't think that she, that she died. It's so crazy that uh, in past stories, when we're reading about the shit the past couple of years, that they mentioned as if the bitch had passed away, and yet we're knowing that, that, that she survived. Um, I wonder if she's still hospitalized. I mean, her being underage, they can't really release that information. 
but it has me curious as fuck. And we try to, man, the, the system is abused so often that it makes me super fucking cynical and like a little bit jaded because I, I don't know what to fucking believe. You know, you believe what you want to believe, but I mean, just like we've seen the stories earlier with someone's trying to fucking use an emotional support animal to bring a fucking peacock with you. I mean, the the the, the fucking <laughs> the far reaches that we will go to get what the fuck we want is despicable. And not to say that these girls are, you know, using, you know, whatever excuses as an excuse. So, I mean, forgive my saying there, but it's just it's just so hard to believe sometimes and you feel like just justice will never get done. But again, they're gonna be doing their time, and who knows what kind of effect that has in itself as well. I think I lost my sense of smell. You going smell blind, son? So let's take this. What the fuck? Uh, flight across the world here. Uh, Cambodian authorities have accused ten foreigners of violating the country's anti-pornography laws after police raided a party in Siem Reap, uh, close to the famous ruins of Angkor Wat. The group, which includes at least five UK nationals, as well as two Canadians and a Norwegian and a New Zealander, uh, they're being accused of preparing pornographic materials, a charge which could see them face up to a year in jail if found guilty. Now, the Cambodian authorities have distributed photos which they allege show the group simulating various sexual positions, and it is not clear whether the photographs were taken at the party where the arrest had actually taken place. But it's a group of white folks, and they're the closest white folks around, possibly. Anyways, the suspects, speaking anonymously to Britain's uh, press association, said that they did not understand why they were being detained, and that none of those arrested are the same people who appear in the photographs released by police. Which is some bullshit, because I saw a picture of the same bitch wearing one of the same shorts, and she like she was free to go. So, I don't know, but she was in one of them pictures, though. Anyways, honestly, she goes that they're they're confusing and everyone's confused. They raided, rounded us up. There was about eighty to hundred people at this motherfucking party, and some of them were tourists. And then about thirty of them, police officers. Now, when uh, the accused were taken into custody, um, Sung Sothia, who's one of the lawyers representing the group, uh, who all is, I guess, aged between 20 and 33 years old, uh, told them that they're initially a 15-day period while the investigation continues. I guess that's how long they're going to be held for, but the detention can be up to four months should more evidence become available. Now, when they tried to reach out to them, we, they didn't really get a response because I guess they are trying to shit, do shit through Facebook. I guess they tried to get in communication, but they posted some of these pictures, and it just got me wondering, like, it either looks like they're about to have an orgy with their clothes on, and the little motherfuckers were watching. Uh, turns out that um, that there is, I guess, some kind of ministry that I'm not too sure if they're out there, like, for for that purpose, like, to like to witness or whatever it is that the fucking Muslims do. Not Muslims, what am I thinking? Mormons, uh, you know, when they go out to Mexico and all these other drug-infested, gang, gang-related areas. Uh, but also they're getting their freak on. So again, I'm not too sure if that was just their light way of doing so because they had clothes on. I mean, I, I, I it, it, it's, it's confusing because they get, they consider because they are in sexual positions and they're, like they're fucking grinding that, um, you know, it could be considered pornography. Uh, but I figured people went to Cambodia to fuck with little boys anyway, so, like, why are they getting so upset? I don't know, maybe I'm confused, maybe I don't understand, maybe this was, like, highly, um, you know, traditional ritual land where, you know, their gods had maybe walked upon, I, mean, I, I don't fucking know, but it's, it's some what the fuck shit for damn sure. So from some what the fuck to that's fucked up, ain't it, though? I saw the news. A 32-year-old man died in a freak accident in India after being sucked into an MRI machine. Mr. Rajesh Maru carried an oxygen container into a room of near hospital in Mumbai uh, with an active MRI scanner, and his magnetic forces dragged him in. Motherfucker, it dragged him in. That's when the oxygen cylinder apparently broke, emitting fatal uh, concentrations of liquid oxygen that Maru had inhaled. And uh, Maru's uncle told the AFP that the hospital employee had allowed his nephew into the MRI room 
and the and I guess the the ward boy who was supposed to prevent such uh, incidents had told the family members to go inside when the machine was turned on, and obviously were shocked and devastated to fucking for, for that fucking outcome. But holy shit! And I got some other things that I'm gonna talk about once we get into the science uh, segment here of the show, so y'all can tune in later. Whatever time you see up here, if you're watching the video, if y'all listen to this, I don't fucking know what time it is yet, but uh, magnets are strong. Energy fields is strong when you're dealing with shits up in the space. Them shits is strong. So I can't believe that um, that there'd be such a situation, though, for him to have this. this uh, see, I, I went to a ghetto high school, so I really didn't get the chemistry uh, that most people had in chemistry. When you went to high school, you had the beakers, you had the liquids, and this and that, and this com- you know, that combustion. Fuck, I never went, we never had that. I don't know if it was just me. I don't know if I was just absent for that because I had really bad truancy uh, at that point in my life. Um, but I just never realized how those shits come together. So to not know this is a tragedy um and to fucking have hired help work there not tell you this shit is a goddamn crime all right so from crimes of stupidity to just crimes of let's say blood diamonds and that there other about 950 workers remain trapped in a gold mine in south africa after storms caused a power cut preventing them from getting out God damn without electricity lives cannot bring the night shift workers to the surface but they appear to be fine supposedly they said that about 65 miners who so far have been rescued and accounted for um, the other ones again remain to be fucking trapped now trade union officials also feared that the lives of the miners trapped since uh, you know, it's been a few days, or actually, by this time, time of year here, it's been a fucking a week uh, since they've really known anything. And South Africa is leading uh, gold producer, so the industry uh, has been accused of poor safety records. But again, if that's their fucking milk and butter, milk, honey, butter, however that shit goes, if it's if it's bringing them cheese, then they ain't gonna want to fucking wheeze on these sort of expensive. Uh, expenses like safety precautions. So again, haven't really kept up too much on this since then. Uh, but fuck, weren't the motherfuckers in Chile down there for a good fucking year? I mean, they got a movie and you know, all, but motherfuckers still have you know probably can only taste shit if they fucking douse it in hot sauce. Um, ah shit, that's all they got to say. It's just kind of a fuck situation. That has been your world news. I can't get jiggy with this shit. So shouts out uh, to Nintendo, the Japanese video game maker has reported its biggest third quarter operating profit uh, in about eight years. And it's been driven by the demand of its new uh, Switch games console and its expected annual earnings to outstrip its previous estimates. Now, growing popularity for this hybrid home portable system known as Switch has led to near doubling of Nintendo stock's price uh, to nine-year heights since the device's launch back in March. I was pissed myself because if I had money, I would have done invested, especially once I see that these motherfuckers are going to make a killing off of fucking cardboard. And y'all see uh, when it comes out this 420, but... Um, In comparison to initial estimates, um, they beat the lifetime numbers of the predecessor system called the Wii U, leaving suppliers fucking scrambling for parts. Now, the fuck thing about the Wii U system, and I love it, it's honestly one of my favorite systems, had some of the dopest exclusive games that you couldn't get anywhere else. Now you're going to probably see it ported onto the motherfucking Switch. But it just, it didn't click with people because they associated it with the fucking Wii that I'm pretty fucking sure most people in America or around the world have, and it's just collected dust. Because all you use that, that bitch, that bitch, or bitch, or bitch, or bitch, or or what's your fucking, um, goddamn, what was it, Wii Sports, something of that nature. Anyways, the Switch console sales will likely hit 15 million units in the year. Uh, to March and is going to climb to 20 million by next year. Nintendo said that it's fielding hopes to and the repeated success again of the first Wii that debuted back in 2016, selling more than 100 million units. Now they're quoted in saying that the momentum for the Switch over the last 10 months has been stronger than that of the Wii. And Nintendo's president had also uh, verified that the key to the Switch's success 
it, in the second year will be to attract non-gamers. Now, analysts believe that Nintendo's plan to launch the Labo, which they say is like a Lego-style accessory console, it, it's it's more like it's like a creative way for them to use cardboard sheets that can pretty much make these little things. Uh, you have to, you have to, have to t t do your Googles, go into YouTube, type in Nintendo Labo. You have to see this shit for yourself because they're able to craft these little uh, wonders that make the controllers in the system itself into either like a remote control car or a uh, fucking st uh, steering for a motorcycle or a uh, fucking fishing pole or a piano. There's all these crazy things that, that they're able to do that just make it fucking genius. Super genius, in fact, that they're gonna fucking sell it for seventy to eighty dollars plus a ten dollar essential pack, and people are gonna buy it the fuck up. They're gonna destroy it the fuck up. They're gonna buy more of it the fuck up. And even if Lord forbid it, it would be a you know a wash. It's fucking cardboard. They lost nothing, or hardly anything to it. Fucking pennies on the dollar. I mean, they're based out of fucking Washington, fucking hipster, uh, recycle capital of the world. But anyways, Nintendo sold 7.2 million Switch consoles in the three months through December. And um, its annual sales forecast by a million from early projections of like in the 14 million units. It again surpasses the lifetime sales that they had from its last system console, the Wii U. Now, it just, uh, again, shouts out to them because I'm a big fucking Nintendo fanboy. Uh, they just, they figured it out. And on top of that, Nintendo, uh, who definitely has been very tight with their IPs for for sake of, I guess, not oversaturating the market, but also just not letting it be bastardized like it did in the early 90s from allowing, uh, what was it, Linux or some PC shit or Turbo Graphics. I, I fucking forget. Someone made a Zelda game that was fucking retarded. Uh, and if any of y'all saw the John Leguizano Super Mario Brothers movie, that shit was retarded. Um, there's a couple things that they've done that just, you know, definitely didn't have the quality control that they have now. I mean, to the point where they don't, they won't let too many fucking YouTubers post that shit without fucking raping every cent that they earn, uh, because again, what they believe their intellectual property, you know, provides them and for, for a fucking good reason, because it, it's a money making motherfuckers want it. If you can see it, it's like crack, you just, you gotta have it. Uh, but shouts out to them not only teaming up with Universal in the realm of making um, Universal Studios for a limited time in 2020 a uh, Nintendo World kind of thing, uh, but they've also fucked with them on the production standpoint because uh, they're going to team up with the Illumination Studios, the people that brought you Minions and uh, Despicable Me and most recently Sing. Uh, we're going to team up with them to make a Super Mario movie. So that should be exciting. I'm wondering if they're going to include any of the Raving Rabbids. Uh, since they are in itself like uh, minions of sorts. Uh, but yeah, so please believe your kids will get hooked. And uh, experience Mario if they haven't already. And hopefully they don't have some kind of fucking scream shit that the minions and rabbits do. Because that shit pisses me the fuck off. It makes me want to drown some children. But... Uh, again, shouts out to Nintendo for bringing out the kid and the kid in us uh, to be able to enjoy good-hearted entertainment. But speaking of motherfuckers that are going to be making money hand over fist, sales of the boring company's flamethrower, which seemed to start a throwaway line to help the company sell hats, have toppled over 7,000 units. Now, according to a tweet from Elon Musk, uh, early back this week, this means that he has taken in $3.5 million. Now, the flamethrowers went on sale this past Sunday with a pre-order price of $5.50. Uh, also on sale was a fire extinguisher with a boring company sticker on it for $30. Fans quickly laid down their cash, and the whole idea of a burning, or I'm sorry, of a because uh, the name of the company is called The Boring Company. The idea of the flamethrower started as a joke when I, Musk had said that he had sell one of his company's uh, first managed to sell 50,000 hats. But then Sunday he had posted a, a video on Instagram of himself playing with the flamethrower and sales began soon after and they expected to begin uh, shipping this spring. Now, Elon Musk, who continues to embrace the absurdity of actually selling a flamethrower 
though noting that uh, they'll be handing a zombie apocalypse, which he later on said that he wasn't planning. Uh, but he had to put on the tweet saying, when a zombie apocalypse happens, you'll be glad you bought a flamethrower, work against hordes of undead, or your money back. And then later on, because uh, I guess a lot of motherfuckers were retweeting and responding and liking and sharing they were saying that he was spreading rumors like he was secretly creating like a zombie apocalypse to generate demand for the flamethrowers, which he had immediately said it was false. He goes, I could, he's like, uh, you need millions of zombies for a so-called apocalypse anyway. Where would I get a factory big enough to make so many? But, you know, you never fucking know what part of the machine you might be, you know what I'm saying, sucking the teeth off of. But it's just crazy that Elon Musk made $3.5 million selling flamethrowers and he sold every single one. Well, fuck it. I bet Elon Musk can just fucking throw, play 52 card pickup with credit cards that have a limitless uh, capabilities on top of strippers. But speaking of fucking spin on these hoes, hackers are now able to make ATMs spit cash like winning slot machines. And they're now operating inside the United States, uh, marking the arrival of jackpotting, which attacks uh, after a widespread heist uh, first started in Europe and Asia. Uh, but now thieves are using these skimming devices on the ATM machines to steal debit card information. Uh, but the jackpotting argues are more sophisticated technology uh, that challenges the American financial firms. And what they're going to be coming up with the next couple of years. Now, this is the first instance of jackpotting in the United States. And they're saying that it's safe to presume that they're here to stay at this point. Because they weren't able to get shit with who the fuck was attacking it. Who was hacking it. And they're reporting that um, this jackpotting attacks uh, in the past few days. Uh, though specific places it weren't really... Uh, I guess, called out. Uh, but it goes, this represents the first confirmed cases of losses due to logical attacks in the U.S. And this should be treated as a call to action to take appropriate steps to, return, uh, to protect their ATMs against these forms of attacks and uh, mitigate any sort of consequences. Now, again, this is uh, a malware that they use, just how they would give you information. I mean, I'm not too sure if when they have these uh, shits spit out cash, I'm not too sure if this, this is coming from one particular account or if it's just easier to just have this shit just start just fucking spitting it out. And they're mostly uh, attacking those... Um, ATMs are just by themselves, which I never fucking understood, just because I'm like, why the fuck would you put this in the middle of nowhere? You're asking for it to be fucking tampered with. I know for damn sure there's one on fucking 24th Ave, like Camelback here out in Phoenix, which I was, I'm, I'm praying that I could just be having me pass around that day and just see them just fucking showing that shit out there because I will take out my safety net and catch them bitches like I was fucking butterfly hunting in a goddamn Pokemon game because with the way Bills is nowadays, who the fuck couldn't use a little bit of jackpot in, in their lives, I'm just saying. Now, as scary as it would be to have our accounts hacked and the little itty-bitty amount of dollars that are in there just to keep the motherfucking account active until the next check comes in would be fucking devastating and be fucking heartbreaking and, and it would cause so much fucking damage and the top 1% have no idea what that struggle would ever fucking be. Not because I assume that, you know, their money's been passed on from generation to generation, but I mean, they just, they just don't fucking know. Nor would they fucking care if they could dig their fangs just a little bit deeper and three, if not uh, part of the topical Illuminati uh, said, said and said quote unquote whatever the fuck how you say uh, nigga from Amazon uh, Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan Chase are launching a new healthcare company and man if you didn't think healthcare shits were fucking you raw dry without consent before motherfucker wait until you hear this shit which of course is not going to go into those sorts of details but you got to think about it healthcare costs are pretty much tapeworm on the American economy. Uh, and it was actually quoted by Mr. Berkshire Hathaway, chairman and CEO of Warren Buffett. And he said that his firm is teaming up with Amazon, uh, Mr. Bezos, and J.P. Morgan Chase to create a new company with the goal of supposedly providing high-quality health care for the U.S. employees at lower cost. So again, if it's just for their employees... 
then that then that might kind of say, oh, well, then they would make it more alluded to want to uh, work for said company. So uh, let's see what's going on. The new company is said to be a free from profit making incentives and constraints. Mm. As it tries to find ways to cut costs and boost satisfaction with the health care plans for employees of Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan Chess. Chase. Chess. Chase. The trio unveiled their new venture, and they're talking about the initial focus of the company uh, being on technology solutions. that are going to provide U.S. employees and their families with simplified, high-quality, transparent health care at a reasonable cost. Now, to be transparent, usually it's just to tell you how, the facts and how much shit's going to cost. And to add that with reasonable cost either makes me hopeful or makes me believe they're delusional. Now, the uh, enterprise unites the three of the largest and most evaded companies, envied companies. I can't fucking read to save my life. And they're saying that the prospective sectors, uh, which, are, of course, include uh, retail, banking, and a white portfolio of retail everywhere else, which again, they fucking have a cobra clutch on the game. Uh, and I guess things like uh, Geico and Fruit of Loom aren't, aren't too far off from wanting to, you know, get onto the teat of things. And again, I don't know if this is just kind of like a who's who in Fortune 250s or uh, certainly less than 500s. I don't know how that shit works. But to say that the healthcare system is complex. Uh, and that we enter into the challenge open-eyed about the degree of difficulty. This is by Jeff Bezos, the founder and CEO of Amazon. He's saying that it's hard that, it, as it might be reducing healthcare's burden on the economy, uh, economy while uh, improving outcomes for employees and their families would be well worth the effort. Now, again, you have to be in a business to make uh, business and to make money and to down da- So, again, in order to do all these sort of things, I, I don't know how they can better uh, it than making it cheaper, but they ain't making it cheaper. They're, they're telling you they're giving you high quality and making it affordable. But still, I mean, there's, uh, there's just so much that hasn't been said in this. And mind you, they're just going to fucking start. But I'm wondering, how is it going to compare to things in the long run? How much do you have to pay up front? How is it that it can be possible? Uh, and again, of course, I wonder if it's going to be limited uh I don't know. It's just I'm curious because we we got warehouses down here, for example, for Amazon. So in that case, by paying, you know, getting the shitty twelve, thirteen dollar job uh, an hour paying job, uh, am I then gonna have the kind of health care and coverage that is gonna you know take care of a fucking family of uh, six? You know what I'm saying? Like, where does it outweigh? And even then, getting paid at such a shitty commission is that gonna cover shits for y'all? Because there's always like three tiers of things. Uh, you know, good, better, and best, always aiming to show you how the best is the best. Uh, is this going to be just for executives? I mean, uh, how how deep can it go, and at what point will it challenge uh, the marketplace? You know, and, and with everything that uh, has been built up and taken down because of whatever fucking first name is on top of a, of a plan that ends with the word care, can really give a fuck, nor care about the people in which it's affecting. Um... But and this is business news, so I don't, I don't mean to get too fucking deep into that kind of shit. But damn. Holy hot damn and all the dams in between. You do what you do, you do what you must, and hopefully in that regard there ain't too much change and too much fuss. Uh, but we found out last week uh, during a earnings call, which again, this is just this is this is that quarterly call with all, most companies kind of showing put up or shut up. And we definitely saw on the downs and that shit kind of going down the decline because uh, shit isn't always what you seem to hope it to be. Well, Harley Davidson Incorporated announced that it's going to produce an all electric motorcycle, which again, if you're a fan, you might feel some type of way because that ain't the way. Uh, but if you just look at it from a fucking perspective of, you know, where our cars are going, then why the fuck wouldn't bicycles uh, do the same thing? But now, uh, along with being accompanied by the announcement of additional job cuts and a plant closure at the Milwaukee uh, base organization, uh, it came. It also came that four years after Harley unveiled its live wire projects, a, a prototype of all electric motorcycles that shit might be arrive, be on the up and up. Because again, we're gonna, you know, follow current trends and such. Uh, but they quoted saying, "You've heard us talk about Project Live Wire." 
and pretty much it's an active project that we're preparing to bring a market within 18 months. Now, if it's anything like its predecessor, the new motorcycle, which was not named, will carry a roughly 50-mile range to be able to go from 0 to 60 per hour in 4 seconds. Now, by comparison, Zero's SR uh, hits 60 in about 3.3 seconds, which, God damn, that's rather fast. And Mission R Racer uh, has a top speed of more than 150 uh, miles per hour with a sub Three seconds sprint time, which the standard Ducati Monster uh, 1200 uh, motorcycle can hit 60 in under th three seconds. Now, this decision is supposedly comes at a time when the electric motorcycle market is small but growing. And if, uh, from a 2016 report, market research firm uh, Tech Navio predicted that 45% growth in the electric motorcycle industry uh, will be hit by 2020. Now, as this stands in the, the stark contrast uh, to the deepening slump that is the U.S. motorcycle demand, uh, industry retails are actually down 6.5% uh, in the fourth quarter and fell 11% in the fourth quarter of uh, to the 8.5 from last year. So again, it's just it's what motherfuckers gotta do to survive. And what's crazy is as I'm looking at this shit, I'm not. It's not like we're hitting some Tron esque shit just yet. But it's definitely to the point where like, okay, okay, we're evolving. Okay, okay, I see where it's going. But it's like, but it's losing. It's hardly feel. You know what I'm saying? It's now looking like some like some motherfucking crotch rocket. Uh, shit that you'd fucking see on Biker Boys. Shouts out to Biker Boys. Again, so uh, relevant in the month of black history. Um, but it's, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't fucking know. Who's, I mean, I'm too much of a fucking pussy to get one myself anyway. Even though it's been, I'm a bucket of fucking list. But when it came down to having the cash for it, I had to get a, a spare family vehicle. That's just what you gotta do when you use a family man until you hit 40 and go through your midlife crisis. You finally say, fuck it, and you buy yourself a motorcycle. Uh, who knows if by then, if it'll be legally uh, required to have an electric one. Although I would love me a fucking just old school bobber uh fucking grape ape fucking monkey handlebars you know what i'm saying blunt. just chill my bitch with ass hanging out yeah So for any of y'all that might have missed it this past week, uh, the Grammys are taking place. Political little motherfucker, because you had uh, Miss Hillary Clinton reading uh, from that book. I forget from Fire and Fury. I forget who wrote it. Uh, we had Dave Chappelle, Ken Lamar, making an unusual pairing, but, you know, doing what they do best. And which, uh, shouts out to K. Dr. God for uh, stumping old Jay-Z. Which, uh, by the way, the biggest takeaway from what it seemed like was that everyone was so, like, mesmerized that Ivy was a little cunt, uh, telling their parents, you know, not to clap so damn much. Uh, speaking of country or douchebaggery, Beyonce had some shades inside, so there was that. Uh, Janine Monet, Janelle Monet, uh, had presented uh, Kesha and I was like where the bitch where have you been you always see you looking extra but just what have you been doing uh, and by the way that uh, story or that book from Fire and Fury was by Michael Wolf that motherfucker has been on a tirade uh, trying to shit on what's been going on with him in Tennessee and uh, the office inside um, and, and also in, in Weird and Revenge just it being a 90s sort of thing 
the first live performance, I think, of um, Bruno Mars and Cardi B's uh, latest song. I forget what the fuck she's called. Not West Pappin. That was her fucking track. But yeah. Um, um, Camilla Cabello, she's the one who was presenting right before um, Blue Ivy. I kind of told her parents to calm the fuck down with all the clapping. I didn't know that she was um, uh, fucking Cuban and Mexican descent. Uh, but definitely fucking adorable. Cutie loved the fucking pedophile glasses she was rocking. Uh, Logic, no doubt, has been uh, really popping with that song. Uh, 1-800-273-8255. That, that suicide hotline track. Definitely deep fucking story. Video, bananas. John Cheeto, just fuck it. Just all, all, all good all around. Uh, my big girl, bad baby, mama, Sarah Silverman and Victor Cruz had presented uh, that fucking Despacito bullshit song. Uh, but she was just looking dashing and all around mesmerizing as she normally do. Uh, throwing in jabs about voting and how uh, it's very important. Then kidding, no, it's not. The world's almost done anyway. Uh, the, a, a lot of this shit, obviously, leaning heavy on the fucking left. Uh, should not go um, ignored uh, because again, it's following a movement. It's following these things, and and then I laughed how they're trying to make shit so pro woman. Uh, and not to say that women can't dress sexy, because I know that's that's considered slut shaming. But look what you're labeling. You already call it a slut. So I just I just think that we just take such fucking ass backward kind of fucking attempts to try to uh, you know cure all and put these fucking band aids on top of shits. But again. It's all for fucking entertainment, people. Don't be alarmed. Motherfuckers be woke. All right, so from watch popping to pussy popping, all around popping, hopping, and getting the fuck out of the goddamn way, an Instagram fitness model was kicked off an American Airlines flight in Miami, uh, again, due to disputes with the crew. Uh, fitness coach and Instagram celebrity Jen Settler uh, was aboard a flight out Miami International Airport, I guess on her way to New York, and to where she had it fucking was removed by police. She was quoted saying that she did nothing wrong, but got kicked off the plane uh, in her tweets to her millions of fans and uh, gawkers and masturbators. She, and an American had offered her a hotel accommodations and transportation, which she had declined, according to the airplane or airline services. And in the video posted by uh, Selter, a uh, woman's voice can be heard explaining to a man who appears to be the pilot that a flight attendant asked her to sit after she had stood uh, to put up her jacket while the plane was uh, delayed. Now, several voices can be heard explaining the situation to the pilot. It is unclear which one is uh, Selter's. But the woman behind the camera had told the pilot that the flight attendant explained to her that the plane could not move until she sat down. But she, but the uh, the two other people in the row were in the bathroom at the time. Uh, now, there's also a quote saying that we also said, would you like to get off? And she said, yes. The unidentified flight attendant told the pilot, I was obviously being sarcastic, ma'am. Uh, and the woman behind the camera uh, you know, then replied, Again, talking shit, but any time that happens, you being in the said situations, you really don't want to be the motherfucker to have to start a ruckus. It's just some bullshit. Um, so, I mean, pretty much, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm pretty damn sure, especially because, again, she has some celebrity, you know what I'm saying? People uh, know her because she has a fat old ass. Uh, you know, she's probably, you know, a bit on the conceited and, and probably well-to-do side. You know, just it's just natural, right? Uh, and all the more sting in the behind uh, that is... Uh, you know, probably her main asset, uh, and that's why she was being so bad. It's just it, it's it's a bitch, and whether or not she was being a bitch and the bitch was hating, bitch on bitch crime, uh, never ends well. Alert, alert, and, alert, uh, alert. Yeah. Right, so speaking of bitches and do nothing bitches and the opposite opposite type of bitch that you generally never see, uh, Ronda Rousey. Shifts to wrestling with a surprise WWE Royal Rumble cameo. And I bet my fucking dude, Arizona Universe creamed his pants when shit, this shit had fucking popped off. Uh, but once the most dangerous woman in MMA, 
Rousey officially has made the anticipated jump to WWE back uh, this past uh, two Sundays ago from the time you're hearing this now at the Royal Rumble in Philadelphia. And the former UFC Bantamweight champion also told ESPN that she's fully committed to wrestling and she's not planning on just making cameos uh, in their big events. She goes, this is my life now. They have first priority on my time for the next several years. She says, this is not a smash and grab. This is not a publicity stunt. Now, Rousey had appeared to a roaring fans after the Women's Royal Rumble had, had finished off in, in Philadelphia this past was, uh, fucking WrestleMania ago. And she's scheduled to uh, for New, New Orleans in April um, as uh, the Joan Jets' bad reputation had bled to the arena. So... I'm wondering if that's when WrestleMania is, if that's in New Orleans. I'm not too sure. But Amber Rousey, she was smiling when the Royal Rumble winner, Asuka, had slapped her hand away to offer a handshake. Rousey left the ring and walked over to to the executive uh, and Royal Rumble commentator, Stephanie McMahon, also known as uh, uh, Triple H's cum dumpster and also Vince McMahon's uh, daughter. Rousey had shook hands with McMahon and left without saying a word. She slapped hands with fans along the ringside and pretty much just yucked it up to all the good old drama that pops off in the whole wrestling world. And she was quite saying, this has been a dream of mine since uh, me and all my girlfriends would sit around and watch wrestling together. She goes, no matter how much I try to do things in my life, it kept following me around. It's time to take a hint from the universe and go for it. And she seemed like well fit for it because she kind of was straight faced and, you know, she she could play a good, um, what's the word, um, poker, you know, poker face. Like it just fit well. And she's definitely going to be a fucking hero in this shit, especially since you know, everyone was kind of being cunts to her. Um, and again, I, I can't fucking commentate too much on this shit. Uh, the homie Jesus fucking had to hook me up with being able to uh, uh, get, get her with uh, the WD Network. So kind of tasting and being able to watch it. Fucking kids enjoyed it. Watching the, the girls kind of ham at it uh, was both cringeworthy, but also uh, interesting to watch. And just to kind of see her kind of get in, into it, like, that, that shit had, like, surprised me, like, off tops. And I wish I didn't see it in fucking headlines. Luckily, thanks to the uh, miracle that is uh, the lo- short-term memory loss of marijuana and also just all the fucking week's events that had kind of taken me out, out of mind and, and out of sight, so to speak, as you know, as far as this topic goes. When, it, when I finally got around to watching it, like, I totally forgot that she was going to make a cameo. And just seeing her there, you know, and as the jar had popped off, I was like, oh, shit, this is nice. Um, even when watching, like, like the males portion of it, like, motherfucking Rey Mysterio came out of nowhere. And that was my dude, you know, being the being Latino and everything like that. That's that's the one guy I kind of had to look, uh, look forward to and look up to. Uh, as well as, you know, Conan back when the WCW days. But anyways, just kind of seeing that, I thought was dope. Uh, fan favorites there, of course, you know, were dope. Um, the betraying of your partner uh, said, you know, side story, of course, always happens. Um, but yeah, she was looking man interesting. And I'm, I'm really down to see how she takes it and whether or not um, she's going to kind of bring the idea of, you know, giving true licks, you know, so to speak, because we know she could take a fucking hit uh, and we know that she can dish it out. Now, how is it going to be around other people who, you know, are merely playing on stage? That shit remains to be seen and definitely uh, adds to the factor of it being the most electrifying uh, entertainment shit in the universe. All right, so speaking of white women, which may or may not arguably be the kryptonite to most black men, and who's blacker than Wesley Snipes, he had revealed, uh, I guess, like an untold story behind his Black Panther film. Now, getting the project off the ground was an uphill battle that had included script rewrites, uh, director uncertainty, storytelling clashes, and also CG technology that was inadequate to create the fictional nation of Wakanda. And in the mid-1990s, while riding a wave of box office hits after box office hits uh, that propelled him into superstardom, uh, black-ass Wesley Snipes undertook a bold initiative, and it was to make a film about the Marvel character called Black Panther. 
now the African superhero who is now a household name thanks to Juggernaut's uh, Marvel film franchise, including him in the 2016 uh, Captain America Civil War, uh, star Schwark, uh, or Chadwick Boseman's work as uh, T. Chilia, which I guess is the Black Panther, uh, quickly became a fan favorite, which helped them launch the character's first uh, self-titled feature film opening February 16th. Now, uh, hype uh, for the Ryan Coogler directed movie, also starring Lupita Nyong'o and uh, I don't know if I can say that, Michael B. Jordan, of course, in every black movie, uh, is the at a boiling point. And uh, pre-ticket sales broke the Fundango record, and the film projected to open to like 100 million to 120 million. And could become the biggest launch for a Marvel Cinematic Universe Heroes first standalone movie, that is. Not to mention the buzz of the films um, after the Hollywood's premiere, you know, kind of, you know, gone on to show off a bunch of dope stuff from uh, Kendrick's Lamar's. Uh, I don't know if he was mass producing, the, not mass producing, but helping produce and put together the lineup, which seems sick. Have not heard it yet. I got the iTunes. Um, playlist or what's it called fucking whatever shit they make you that they charge you monthly so you can hear shit so I gotta jump on that haven't yet wasn't really feeling the single didn't want to fucking uh, listen to the mixtape then watch the movie have none of that shit be in there so I was like you know, I'm waiting on it but again month of February let's, let's fucking set the shit ablaze uh, but yet some 25 years ago it was a much different story though uh, Snipes' uphill battle was plagued again with the script rewrites, not figuring out who the fuck was going to direct it, not having the proper CGI to fucking do it, and there was always rumors about, you know, the defunct project that would ultimately lay a roadmap for 1998's Blade, which is the first hit film based on a Marvel character. I'll have you fucking know, and it was super goddamn dope, Reddit R, none of that fucking Teeny Bopper X-Men bullshit that kind of taken over Fox as a mainstay, uh, but the details still remain murky until now, and for the first time, Snipes pulls back the curtain for the Hollywood Reporter and shares the tale of how his version of the beloved superhero uh, never came quite uh, to fruition despite his efforts and ambition vision, ambitious vision as what they would say. And again, it's just it was just too much to do. I'm surprised that we made the fucking the Fantastic Four movie when we did. I'm surprised we did. I mean, well, Spider-Man, I guess, was kind of what broke the leaps into shit. But I'm going to read to you what he was telling you. He goes, I think Black Panther spoke to me because he was noble. And he was an antithesis of the stereotypes presented and portrayed about Africans. African history and the great kingdoms of Africa. And he had told that they had cultural significance, social uh, significance, and something that the black community and white community hadn't really seen before. Now, the crazy thing about this is that it was created back in 1966 by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Black Panther was revolutionary as the first African superhero in the mainstream comics. The king and uh, kick-butt protector of Wakanda had it all, bronze, brains, wealth, and advanced technology. That's the part that I'm interested in checking out. Now, Snipes had hooked in an instant where he and his then-manager, uh, Doug Robertson, uh, were approached by Marvel for the project and feeling that Africa, uh, save uh, for the unique animal population, was too commonly shown in films as depressing and docile in lands and pretty much what fucking Trump would call a shithole but not really knowing that, you know, they want to show off its beauty and lush history. Now, many people don't know that there was a fantastic, glorious periods of African empires and African royalty. Uh, Mansa Musa, the uh, emperor of West Africa, Miley Empire, uh, and some of the wealthiest men in the world compared to the wealth of today. And he goes, this was very, very attractive. And, and that, uh, tr not Trump, but the fuck we're talking about, Snipe, I love the idea, you know, the advanced technology portion, but thought, it, you know, and thought it was forward thinking, but again, just didn't have the technology at that time. I mean, Marvel was hardly the Disney backed powerhouse that it is today. Uh, and after years of fucking hemorrhaging money, the company declared bankruptcy in 96. And while its competitor, DC Comics, had enjoyed big screen success with Tim Burns, Batman, Christopher Reeve, Superman, I mean, 
it really alluded to Marvel and I mean shit just didn't pop off and again until many years later now Snipes on the other hand he was red hot he was having started in shits like the New Jack City White Man Can't Jump Passenger 57 Rising Sun Demolition Man and again all this uh, I guess made him just look like a fucking black superhero I mean that ultimately again is what pushed uh, the Blade situation going on but Black Panther though being an iconic character who uh, much of the world was unfamiliar with uh, can, you know, just that that's nothing thing that's what makes it the, the biggest fucking gem, you know what I'm saying? When the the B sides that people may not know about, and then they, but then I don't know, it's it's so crazy how a lot of things that were popping off then again now seem more relevant, now have more ties, and now, uh, with technology, not only I mean, I know in the movie basis, we're able to show off more shit, but we're able to know more shit nowadays. And it not just be a typical fucking hood story. I couldn't imagine how um, they would have made it and how just, I don't know, plain it would have been. I mean, there, there's so much to it. I'm going to have uh, links uh, to the stories uh, that there's a whole lot more of. Uh, so stay tuned. All right, so in the spirit of Black History Month and the uh, momentum of uh, black characters, um, I want to kind of go into like a list of just, I guess, the history in which it kind of took uh, for like the black community to have not only someone that isn't fucking big lipped and monkey looking, uh, but to actually fucking have someone that can call their own. Because it wasn't always like we had like how it is now where we have fucking uh, Black Panther even before. We had Blade, or even, I think, uh, DC, which I don't really fuck with that. Something called Black Lightning. Some shit like that. Sounds like a goddamn black dildo. Anyways, a few months before Pearl Harbor had plunged into America, uh, on uh, into the fucking World War front, back when World War II was popping off, Timely Comics, later known as Marvel, published Young Allies. And it was a comic series about a group of kids who would help Captain America and Bucky Barnes fight the Red Skulls. Now, one of the team members is a big-lipped, superstitious, and dim-witted African-American that embodies some of the worst stereotypes of the era, and his name was Whitewash Jones, of course. Again, first stepping stone into having black heroes. Took a bit of time to shake off the, um, I mean, the fuckery of it all, and the blackface, but again, you know, time and patience that's pretty much what either fucking wins the race or gets you to the fucking you know steam uh, but in 1942 the big red cheese uh gets some help and around that same time captain marvel editor ed heron had introduced billy uh, batson simple-minded valet uh steamboat in america's greatest comics issue number two now steamboat was supposed to be a positive role model and was created to draw in black readers but many fans disagreed including over 11,000 school children who called themselves the youth builders and a group of african americans who traveled to Fawcett's uh, editorial offices to protest in person and executive editor uh, will uh, liberson took their side and steamboat disappeared from the book in 1945 again still you know hella stereotypical now by 1944 uh big behind the scenes debut happened and matt baker the first known african american comic book artist made his debut penciling the cover story in jumbo comics number six to nine which features a leopard skin clad crime fighter known as sheena queen of the jungle now the tale, uh, slaves for the for the white sheik, features a noble astro uh, born white hero freeing the hapless black natives who have been forced to participate in illegal pearl harvesting operations. Now, the funny thing, if you look just into it again, having to deal with slaves. Having to deal with Amazons, obviously that a fucking black culture, but you can't sell that shit to motherfuckers in the 1940s. So you're gonna put a white woman on that, and again, get your foot in the fucking door. It's just it was a matter of getting in there, doing what you could. 
And in the late 40s, uh, Orrin Cornwall Evans, who was the first black reporter to handle general assignments for a mainstream white newspaper, produced and published the only issue of all Negro comics, which Time magazine called the first comics to, to, to be drawn by Negro artists and people entirely um, by Negro characters. Now, while Private I Ace Harlem is all Negro comics big star, the issue also featured a story starring Lion Man, a college-educated African-American who ventures to Africa to fight white criminals. Seems simple enough. Now, by 1954, we had the Waku, uh, swinging into action, Marvel then called Atlas introduced its first black hero, Waku, Prince of the ben- Bantu in Jungle Tales number one. Mm, still kind of racy, but uh, while Waku wasn't technically a superhero, he shares many of their traits, including a tragic backstory, because he's orphaned, of course, at the very beginning of his tale, and then uh, resolutes to a uh, no killing policy, which had to have been. Terrible to be so black, so powerful, and yet not be able to kill any of the white folks. Now, by 1964, and mind you, this is past, uh, or maybe around the time that I think uh, Catwoman became black, like in the later part of the Adam West series, I'm not too sure, uh, but Richard Eugene Green, better known as Grass, made waves as the first black man to join uh, the Breguin fan art and underground comic community. Now, his early comic, um, the superhero adventures title uh, Zao Kor, the Human Cat, it, it, it owed a huge debt to the golden age of comics of the 1930s and 40s, and it quickly became one of the most popular features in the star-studded fanzine, which also featured early work in the future Marvel editors-in-chief Jim Starlin and Roy Thomas, who are renowned superhero artists um, like uh, Dave Cockrum, who was part of it as well, and the Game of Thrones author George R. R. Martin. So again, steam picking up, we're going. By 65, mainstream comics finally has its first black title star. And the first American character to headline his own comics arrived when Dell Comics published Lobo No. 1, uh, starring the mysterious gunslinger of the same name. And the series only lasted about two issues, and it was canceled after roughly 90% of retailers refused to sell Lobo because of the lead's skin color. So again, stores themselves being the fucks. And mind you, that could have been because of its audience base. That could have been because of the times. Uh, which is funny because Lobo, known in the Western uh, thing as, or a Spanish culture like as a wolf, again, being of the desert, being of the wild, wild west. It's uh, I don't know if there's any kind of connection with it. I wasn't there. I don't have any fucking issues. I'm pretty sure you maybe y'all can find it at comicbooks.com. Y'all do your fucking Googles. Now, by 1966, all hail the king of Wakanda. Uh, Black Panther, are again, arguably the first real black superhero, appeared in Fantastic Four's number 52 issue, in which he helped Marvel's first family defend Wakanda from Claw, a scientist-turned-supervillain. And Black Panther's real name, T'Challa. Uh, went on to become a mainstay in the Marvel Universe. He joined the Avengers in 1968, starting in the Marvel's first long-running multi-issue story arc in 1973's Jungle Comics uh, number 6, which took on the Ku Klux Klan in the same series in 1976 and made his first big-screen debut in 2016's uh, The Civil War. Again, big fucking jumps, but again, the fucking protector of Wakanda is fucking came to fucking kill it. And uh, by 1969, the Falcon takes to the skies, and Black Panther might be, again, uh, Marvel's first black superhero, but the company's first African-American hero didn't appear until a few years later when Sam uh, Wilson, alias for the Falcon, popped up in Captain America's issue 117. The Falcon quickly settled into the role of Cap sidekick and ultimately assumed the shield and cow when uh, old age caught up with Steve Rogers in 2014. So I thought that shit was pretty dope. I don't know if our cinematic universe now would ever get to that point, but fucking A. 
1970, Ebon beats Marvel to the punch because two years before Luke Cage burst onto the scene, indie cartoonist Larry Fuller, uh, pen name Christian White, published Ebon, E-B-O-N, uh, which is widely considered the first superhero comic with a black main character. Iman uh, might also be the first superhero comic produced entirely by a single black man. Although that's debatable, the comic only lasted for a single issue, but that didn't deter Fuller, who went on to create a hilarious, uh, satirical, and undeniably filthy underground comic series called White Horse, White Whore Funnies, just like it sounds. Now, by 1970, the Green Lantern had learned the lesson, and um, I guess it wasn't until the 70s that DC Comics lineup was very, very white. Writer uh, Denny O'Neill and artist uh, Neil Adams challenged the company's lack of diversity in Green Lantern's issue number 76. The issue includes a now iconic exchange in which a poor African-American man accuses Hal Jordan of ignoring Earth's racial injustices in favor for extraterrestrial threats. Again, that's some sort of progress. Now, again, in 1970, DC's first black superhero, uh, who isn't who you think, uh, I mean, despite what you read lately or been seen on TV for the Black Lightning, uh, Green Lantern, John Stewart's uh, Legion of Superhero member, uh, Ty Rock, and uh, the new God's Avatar of Death, the Black Racer, all hit spinner tracks before him. And DC's first black superhero, however, was actually Mal Duncan, a gifted boxer who joined the Teen Titans in issue 26. I didn't even know they went back that far. Now their ongoing series, um, of course, on today in different kind of universes, I guess, so I'm not too sure if that's still in connection. But uh, while Mal didn't originally have the powers uh, beyond his fighting prowess, he later gained a variety of abilities and went by a number of superhero code names, including Guardian, Hornblower, and Vox. Fucking Vox. Now, uh, by 71, uh, the Kryptonians became racist too, because a year later, uh, in Superman 239, DC Comics had made a misguided attempt to explain why we'd never see Kryptonians of color before. Apparently, black Kryptonians were segregated from the rest of the population and lived somewhere called uh, Vathio Island. Understandably, Vathio Island was only mentioned a handful of times before it disappeared entirely, uh, but it would make sense that the whites and the blacks were also segregated on this fucking planet, so when it destroyed, maybe these niggas kept the fucking bloodline lineage going. I mean, they kind of let that go because they realized, oh, that's pretty fucking racist that we allow segregation to happen in the goddamn comics. Now, by 72, a cover star was born, and the first mainstream black superhero to get his own comic book was Luke Cage, who debuted in Luke Cage. Hero for Hire. Initially, Luke Cage was a jab-talking hustler, and his Avengers relied heavily on tropes and stereotypes from popular black exploitation films. Eventually, the black exploitation craze ended, and Luke's title faded away. However, the bulletproof hero has been a fixture of Marvel's universe ever since, especially since getting up on Netflix in 2016. Um, and I'm pretty sure that can only grow more, especially. If, um, you know, they're going to need to diversify shit a bit more. But who fuck knows. Now, by 73, Wonder Woman's sister, again, a true Amazonian, uh, came into play. Now, DC might have been behind the curve when introducing black superheroes. But it actually beat Marvel on the super heroine front. And in Wonder Woman 204, DC introduced Nubia, a black Amazon with a claim to Wonder Woman's title. Like Diana... Nubia was was crafted out of clay and brought to life by the gods. Unlike Diana, though, Nubia was raised by Mars, the god of war, and not by Hippotia. Nubia is also a better fighter than Diana and beat Wonder Woman in a duel before returning to her home, the floating island, in her debut story. Now, by 1975, a new goddess was in town, and the giant-sized X-Men number one didn't just prevent Marvel's merry band of mutants, but it also introduced Aronno Monroe, 
better known as Storm. Fuck yeah. Shout out to Halle Berry. Marvel's first black superheroine. Now raised as a thief on the streets of Cairo, the young mutant was regarded as a goddess of her native African uh, land after her weather-controlling powers had kicked. Later, Charles Xavier tracked her down and made her a core member of the X-Men team. So shouts out to that. Now 75, M. Shula and Kamiya uh, were sitting up in a tree and the first interracial kiss in mainstream superhero comics took place in Marvel's Amazing Adventures number 31 when M. Shula, Scott, and uh, Carmilla Frost, allies of the Freedom Fighters, kill Raven and lock lips during a down moment. Interestingly enough, though, that was actually the second interracial kiss that writer Don McGregor had snuck into mainstream comics. The first had been in the creepy... A uh, horror titled uh, from Vampiria publisher Warren after McGregor's first uh, misread the writer's script and added an unintended smooch between the two leads. Again, how that could be unintended, how you can go out of your way, I have no idea, but I'm not here to argue. Now, by 1977, Black Lightning came around and as the 70s rolled on, uh, DC wanted to, you know, their own take on black heroes like Luke Cage, like Black Goliath. And who got his own superhero identity in the comic book again in 75 um, came to came to be Black Lightning. You know, the company contracted former Luke Cage scribe Tony Isabella and tried to recruit him to write the character named the Black Bomber, who was a white racist who turned into a black man whenever he got angry. Holy shit. Isabella pointed out that this was a terrible idea and countered with Black Lightning, a super powered high school principal who assumed his superhero mantle out of the desperation, not some higher calling. DC approved, and Black Lightning went to become DC's first African-American headliner. But could you believe to be some fuck? White. Yo, mic check, one, two, one, two. To be some fucking white man that would turn black every time he got mad? Like, I mean, that leads perfectly for shenanigans, but that's fucking terrible i mean but anyways by 77 there finally was some big screen debuts and the first movie starring a black superhero wasn't a big budget hollywood production it was more of a low-key black exploitation flick called a bar the first black superman later uh renamed in your face to avoid trademark complications but the film uh where it's where a scientist gives a chemical concoction to a local heavy creating a superpowered vigilante who fights neighborhood bigotry and whatnot in a bar was filmed on a shoestring budget and didn't have official permits. But it didn't matter because the police writer shut down filming a real-life motorcycle gang that had been hired to appear in the film uh, scared the fuzz away. Some real fucking muscle man shit. Back up off me. Now, again, it took a fucking giant leap to make any more, you know, baby steps. It wasn't until 1990 that indie creators got in the game. And Brother Man wasn't supposed to be a cultural icon, but artist uh, Duwad Onaibi uh, and his brother, writer Guy Sims, created the character as a parody intended, intended, uh, intended mainly to drive businesses to Anabaibi's airbrushing store. And yet the character and every man who doesn't actually have any powers is widely credited from uh, reinvigorating the black indie comics community. And INDYB uh, sold over 7,500,000 copies of Brother Man before the series ended in 94. And in 2018, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture announced that it would add Brother Man materials to its archives, citing the comic's historical and unique influence on the indie comic scene. And that's kind of a fucking big deal. Now, by 93, uh, the Daku verse is born and fed up with the mainstream comics and lack of diversity. McWilliam McDuffie and a group of other black creators founded Milestone Media, a company devoted uh, to empowering people of color both on and off panel, 
and Milestones book, bro, the Milestones books were published by DC, but the creators retained both editorial independence and intellectual property rights. That's what's up. Now, while Milestones Comics Division closed in '97, its franchises uh, remained popular. Static, one of Milestones' flagship characters, had his own cartoon series in 2000, which I definitely fucked with. I thought that, that's who Black Lightning was, in all honesty. And then other characters like Rocket and uh, Icon made appearances in Warner Brothers. Uh, Sidekick-oriented animated series, The Justice League. And one thing I will say, and this probably doesn't connect to too much of this shit, but there's a lot of sub uh, genre type things and just alternate universes that just end up being real super entertaining for any y'all that fuck with Batman um, y'all should check and who like old school nostalgic shit fuck with something called Batman the Brave and the Bold cause they're um, recreating the comic I guess I don't know if it was a comic before uh, but they're gonna make it into a comic but there was an old cartoon series that was voiced by I forget the brother from uh, Office Space and uh, from the Drew Carey show, but he he voices him, and he's just he's fucking hilarious. I think they even did a crossover with Scooby Doo, and that shit was hella out of place, but yet meshed together because of its campiness. Anyways, if y'all fans of that, check that out. Uh, now, in 1983, Meteor Man crashes, and Meteor Man might be the first mainstream movie featuring a black superhero, but sadly, it wasn't a very good one. And despite the appearances by celebrities like Robert Townsend, James Earl Jones, motherfucking Sinbad, Cypress Hill, Bill Cosby, before he was, um, you know, pill popping. Well, actually, I guess no, it would have been afterward, before he got caught up in all the bullshit. Uh, the campy, lighthearted superhero adventure failed to win the hearts of critics and audiences, and it only made back $8 million of its $30 million budget, which holy shit i totally fucking forgot and now that i look at the fucking picture of it holy shit i had no idea that was actually not even, whatever whatever now the next fucking movie oh my goodness this shit i was obsessed with this maybe wanted to be a superman fan even though they had nothing to do with it uh, but in 1997 uh tale of spawn and steel had popped off now in august 97 the first two superhero flicks starring established black characters debuted at the box office. Spawn, starring Michael J. White as Todd McFarlane's popular anti-hero Spawn, first hit. And then Steel, a Superman spinoff with all references to Superman removed, followed two weeks later while Spawn was a moderate success. Steel tanked, putting a quick end to a star... Um, Shaquille O'Neal's Hollywood Aspirations but I will fucking say I was obsessed with it I bought the fucking toys I don't remember uh, much else than him having a, a, a fucking handicapped white woman being his 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 intel but it made the most perfect fucking, fucking sense besides Shaq being retarded and whatnot. I don't know maybe I wish I could find a DVD of it I, I don't know where the fuck I would find it at but I'd buy it now, by 1998, though, we went fucking vampire hunting and Blade uh, came into play. But Blade wasn't just the first Marvel movie starring a black character. It was the second Marvel movie to ever get a theatrical release in America. And I guess apparently only Howard the Duck uh, beat Blade in Cinema Plexus. So it starred Wesley Snipes as a character first introduced in Marvel's uh, Tomb of Dracula, apparently in, in 73, but Blade single-handedly kickstarted the superhero movie craze because it spawned two sequels, which I remember by the third one, they had uh, Jessica Biel's finance and also, um, what the fuck's his name, Ryan, fuck, I, goddamn Deadpool, you know what I'm saying, and he was just fucking, he was ripping into Parker Posey's ass, saying that she had fans in the coochie, anyways, uh, he got a television spinoff in 06, which, of course, ended up being Marvel's first TV show, and again, it being with the black lead. So that's kind of a big fucking deal. Video games were shit, but the fucking the movies were, were damn dope and fucking cutting edge for the time. Dark, gruesome mover in that techno you know, point in life. Now, in 2004, the truth comes out. In truth, uh, red and white and black, a seven-issue miniseries by Robert Morales and Kyle Baker who tells the story of a government program to recreate Captain America and Super Soldier Serum using black soldiers as test subjects. Fucking 
the Castigi experiments all over again, and most of whom were mutilated or killed by the experiments. Now, online uh, traditional comic book fans uh, condemned the book, while critics praised Marvel's decision to highlight the sordid and brutal history of America's race problem, especially the infamous and highly unethical, uh, again, the, the Tuskegee experiments that fucking with, uh, I think they experimented with syphilis. I was thinking of the guys that they put in the airplanes, but that was, that was a different thing entirely. But again, you had to kind of mix that shit in because you can't just be sugar coating and pussyfooting around. Now, now in 2018, Jefferson Pierce returns, and I think it hasn't been since 2002 that the CB or CW was uh, had become the go-to place for superheroes on television, especially those for DC. And while the network had featured a number of characters of color, particularly uh, uh, in its light-hearted team-up series Legends of Tomorrow, the CW ever-expanding line of DC-themed shows didn't get a black lead until Black Lightning debuted this past January. Now, reinventing Jefferson Pierce as a retired vigilante who needs to suit up again when the criminal gang threatens his family, Black Lightning's first episode scored the best ratings for CW premiere in two years. And it looks, uh, and it's set to, to join The Flash, Arrow, and Supergirl as its mainstay uh, shows. Now, uh, right now, again, in this month of February, Black Panther is on and popping and after 17 big budget superhero adventures starring White Man, Marvel Studios will release its first big screen movie with a black lead. Uh, again, February 2018, when Black Panther hits theaters, I think it might be on the 16th or some shit. I know it's after uh, fucking Valentine's Day, which is a bitch because I actually got that day off. But regardless, the movie has been developed since 2005. Although Wesley Snipes tried to get a Black Panther movie off the ground as far back as 92, the stars Chadwick Boseman, Michael B. Jordan, Lupita Nyong'o, and uh, Black Panther. I mean, it's just a big step forward for Marvel, both behind the camera and, and as well in the front. And the film is directed by Ryan Coogler, who previously filmed, helmed uh, Fruitvale uh, Station, and uh, the Rocky spinoff, Creed, which motherfuckers loved. And that's going to be the first black director that Marvel's ever hired. So, again, if done well, because it definitely seems that they, they got the fucking uh, soundtrack on and popping with the, the god of hip-hop and hip-hop being, of course, uh, the culture uh, for the black community. Uh, this can only fucking mean good things moving forward. Uh, and hopefully just, I mean, all the right entertainment for the rest of us, not only giving us, um, again, entertainment, uh, but hopefully giving us some of that medicine with the candy that, that we're so quick to fucking to suck on. Yes, I'm talking to you, white bitches. Yo, I had to mention this really quick because I'm not a big sports guy. I can give a fuck about the Super Bowl. I can give a fuck about the teams. I'm a local native hometown boy, so that's what I represent just by default. But uh, quick shouts out and fuck you to Tom Brady. Besides him being a cheating ass bitch, which again, I don't give a fuck no shits about. Um, but I started laughing. And it's fucked up because, you know, you should never attack family. But when he had kind of started, you know, getting upset that people were clowning on his daughter. I mean, I kind of just let him to be like, what can you expect? Because, uh, and I pray to God that my, my blood baby will be the best baby ever on earth. I, you got, I, I've come to understand that when kids... Um, I mean, maybe sometimes just by the fucking fault, kids can be little shits. You got to understand that people uh, who aren't related, who aren't of blood, who don't directly love you and all that you do, they're going to see these things and not be, again, convoluted or, or blinded or made fuzzy to the fact that you have a little shit for a daughter. And someone on the radio station, which is one of those real norky, uh, fucking campy ass radio stations on the East Coast that fucking do the hey, 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 now you're calling, little, whatever fuck cock sucking voice. Um, they had uh, called the daughter like a piss ant. And the fucker just, you know, respectably uh, bowed out and fucking left mid interview, uh, which again, was the least of his issues because they, you know, then were going to threaten to fire him. And I guess the team owned that particular radio station, so he kind of has to make these appearances. But you know what kind of station this shit is. But I don't know if he expected to fucking the cocksucking treatment. I mean, long story short, I mean, he got all hissy, but he has a reality show. 
And what do we do when we watch reality shows either to relate or to talk shit? Usually it's to talk shit. So I don't know. Maybe just maybe he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready. That's all it was. He wasn't ready for it. Um, and I don't know. I didn't bother looking up the news to fi- figure out what they said after he had uh, pretty much uh, enticed his little boy uh, to give him a kiss on the lips in order to use the fucking iPad or some shit. Uh, it was a scripted moment gone terribly fucking wrong. And um, I'm sure with all this fucking Me Too nonsense, people would have fucking been clamoring over it. But whatever. I don't watch reality shows. I just know of this. And it got my fucking attention. And um, it segued into the story of white bitches. Get out of here, Dewey. What are y'all doing in here? It's called cocaine. And you don't want no part of this shit. Cocaine? What's it do? It turns all your bad feelings into good feelings. It's a nightmare. I'm thinking maybe I'd like to try me some of that cocaine. Today's going to be the best day ever. Yeah, yeah. Ain't nothing horrible going to happen today. Get out of here, Dewey. You don't want no part of this shit. What y'all doing in here? We doing pills, uppers and downers. They're the logical next step for you. I want some of that shit. All right, for drugs. 20.8 20.8 million prescription painkillers were sent to a West Virginia town with a population of only 2,900. Yeah, between 2006 and 2016, a total of 20.8 million prescription painkillers were sent to two pharmacies in Williamson in uh, Mingo County, West Virginia, a town with a population of under 3,000 people. And the U.S. government panel was now questioning how drug wholesales could have sent millions of prescription pills to two pharmacies in West Virginia uh, without flagging any suspicion. Now, the panel centered around two drug wholesalers who provided drugs to the pharmacies Ohio-based Miami Lucan and Illinois-based H.D. Smith and shipment papers indicated that wholesalers made large deliveries of the drugs over several uh, consecutive days. And the paper also shows extreme increases in the number of drugs ordered uh, from year to year. So both these records should have been uh, sparked suspicion and main drug uh, may have a main drugs identified in the investigation were hydrocodone and oxycodone, two prescription painkillers that motherfuckers love a whole lot. And it, it's shit like this. You wonder how the fuck we have such an opioid epidemic. And it makes me wonder, like, because someone got them shits. You know what I'm saying? People consume that shit. And then supposedly those that don't supposedly flush it and it's fucking making our waters mutate shits. But come on now. There's, there's ways that we definitely, I mean, I don't know how things can be ignored for so long. Obviously, I mean, eventually they're fucking caught up. But holy hot damn, these motherfuckers are getting high. All right, so from painkillers to killers in general, the flu can kill tens of millions of people. And in 1918, that's exactly what it did. Now, when the flu arrived as a great war raged in Europe, a conflict that would leave about 20 million people dead over four years. Now, in 1918, the flu would kill more than twice that number and perhaps five times as many. Now, in just 15 months, now, though mostly forgotten, it has been called the greatest medical holocaust in history. And experts believe that between 50 and 100 million people were killed. More than two-thirds of them died in a single 10-week period in the autumn of 1918. Uh, never have so many died so swiftly from a disease uh, single-handedly. From one single disease, that is. Now, in the United States alone, it killed about 675,000 in about a year. And the same number have died of AIDS in nearly 40 years. Now, as a county, or I'm sorry, as a country muddles through the, this partic- part- particularly nasty flu season, one of the center of disease control motherfuckers says that it's killed 24 children in the first two weeks of January and 37 since the start of the flu season. Now, the 1918 nightmare serves as a reminder that if a uh, uh, virulent enough strain were to, you know, emerge again, a century of modern medicine might not save millions from dying. So that's one of the trippiest things, especially just how things have 
have gotten the way that, you know, like from us having the fucking, um, the fleshy and bacteria, some, all, all these things to which, you know, we just figure, oh, you bumped your head, oh, I'll get some rest, oh, you might have the flu, end up waking up dead, which I know you can wake up dead, because if you're dead, you ain't waking up, but regardless to how the hell that saying goes, I mean, shit's trippy, to say the fucking least. Motherfuckers in California can't even trust coffee anymore. Apparently, California coffee shops may soon be forced to warn customers about a possible cancer risk linked to the morning jolt of Java. And the state keeps a list of chemicals it considers possible causes of cancer. And one of them, acrylamide, A-C-R-Y-L-A-M-I-D-E. I don't know what the fuck you say. But it's created when coffee beans are roasted. And a lawsuit first filed in L.A. County Superior Court back in 2010. The nonprofit Council for Education and Research on Toxics targeted several companies that make or sell coffee, including Starbucks, 7-Eleven, and BP. Now, the suit, uh, the suit alleges that the defendants failed to provide clear and reasonable warning that drinking coffee could expose people to that acrylamide shit. And the court uh, documents state that under California's Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act of 1986, also known as Proposition 65, which is where the 64 order for marijuana, and here we are circling back, businesses uh, give customers a clear and reasonable warning about the presence of agents that affect health and that of those stories fail to do so. So in addition to paying fines and lawsuits wants companies to post warnings about the acrylamide with the uh, explanation about how the potential risks of drinking coffee can again cause cancer and the suit is if the suit is successful the science could be needed to clearly post it at store counters and on walls where people can easily see them when making a purchase imagine like motherfuckers put the surgeon warning on the general surgeon warning on cigarettes just like that and the fact that it ain't bullshit whether you want to believe it or not whether you want to take the risk or not this happens when you do this motherfucker does that not frighten you for the people that drink tea, fuck you. And then for the people that don't drink none of this shit at all, fuck off. For those that um, fuck it in a bucket and take it literal with the sex machines and robots and devices and whatnot, uh, pizza is a healthier breakfast choice than cereal. And that's according to a registered dietitian and uh, their claims. Now they're saying that you might be surprised to find out that an average slice of pizza and a bowl of cereal with whole milk contain nearly the same amounts of calories. Now, this is explained by Chelsea Amer, A-M-E-R, who apparently is an MS, RDN, and CDN. Uh, she had reported to the Daily Meal that it's worth bearing in mind, however, that if you were eating pizza for breakfast, you'd likely have more than one slice because who eats just one slice of pizza? So you would probably be eating more calories in a bowl of cereal in that regard um, however, I mean, pizza, 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 uh, pizza is a healthier breakfast choice than cereal. Now, um, again, with this, I mean, obviously it packs a much larger protein punch, which will lead you to full uh, and boost uh, safety throughout the morning. Uh, plus, a slice of pizza contains more fat and less sugars than most cold cereals. So you will not... Um, experience a quick sugar crash as you would with the sugar i feel my eye just bouncing off its right now right now as i speak now uh, she does admit that pizza isn't exactly a health food and sadly it can't be considered a nutritious option to have regularly uh, she was saying that whist it is true pizza can be a well-balanced meal containing carbs protein and essential fats that is not to say that it's healthier um, then breakfast choice of cereal. So again, I don't know what the fuck we just happened. Or if, if, uh, if all this is an oxymoron, but they're saying that labeling certain meals can sometimes be unhelpful. And when we should really be focusing on this nutritional content of our food choices instead of the calorie count, this is because not all calories are equal. 
And that's some real shit. They say at the end of the day, it comes down to what pizza and what cereal you're eating. Now, some cereals contain a large amount of sugar and have next to no protein or healthy fats to keep you full. Amongst the worst uh, offenders is the British supermarket shelves are Frosties, uh, Cocoa Puffs, Crunchy Nuts. All these things probably just uh, generic offshoots of our names. And they give you a shitload of sugars, 3.7, 3.5. Uh, that's fucking per serving, four point sugars per cube. I mean, that's nearly 15 grams of sugar per serving, which I guess is half of a, if what, what adults are recommended uh, daily allowances are. And many people have more than 40, you know, grams of servings in cereals too. So again, it's all uh, fuck me, fuck you, fuck me, fuck you. Oh, I hope you had a good breakfast. Oh, now I'm sleepy. Oh, the fucking FDA wants to curb abuse of Imodium. And they're saying that this shit is the poor man's methadone, as if meth couldn't get any cheaper. Now, the Food and Drug Administration is asking manufacturers of over-the-counter anti-diarrhea treatments to change the way they package the products to curb the abuse by people using are being used by, you know, drug addictions. Uh, Commissioner Scott Gautier said in a statement uh, that the agency was taking the novel action because of growing concern that abuse of Imodium AD and similar medications were adding to the death toll of the nation's opioid epidemic. Now, the products readily available in supermarkets and drugstores are safe when used as recommended maximum daily dose of 4 to 2 milligram tablets but a large in large quantities these products can actually be dangerous and irregular heartbeats you know, the problems could potentially resulting in death x's in the eyes and now the uh, lopermide 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 l o p l o p e r a m i d e is the generic name of the anti diarrhea agent involved and it becomes referred to as the poor man's methadone now, the lar in large quantities, of course, and it induces a cheap, mild high that relieves withdrawal symptoms for drugs like hy hydrocodone, morphine, and heroin. Uh, and people with addiction problems increasingly are turning to the loropermide. And experts say that as prescription opioids become harder to obtain uh, because of changes in legislations and regulations, these motherfuckers are going to be killing with no anticipation or hesitation. Uh, but the last part is just trying to fucking rhyme, but... Fuck that shit and uh, be mindful. And uh, you might want to stock up if you see it expiring at your local Walmart and you can sell it to your local uh, trailer uh, buddy, uh, hick, friend. Uh, that, that just sounds right. I, I don't like being mean and calling people names. Um, I'm not too sure if this would be surprise visitors, if they'd be the ones who ruled the world uh, before. Those been hiding in the crevices. I don't know what the fuck you want to call it. Uh, but there are some ancient artifacts that are found in Mexican cave, uh, sparking conspiracy theories about aliens visiting Earth. And the video that went viral back to July, or not July, fucking January 25th, I had some people speculating if it could be proof of a aliens having their way to Earth thousands of years ago. Uh, the video was shared on YouTube by Ufomania. It received more than 182 views until the time of uh, publishing here uh, this particular article. And the video claims that Mexican artifacts depicting alien life have been surfaced and are popular among the locals. One of the eerie photos shows artifact uh, with long faces and wide eyes, while other uh, objects apparently show like spaceships flying through the air. Now, many uh, will know that the Claus Donna artifacts, and uh, again, there's tons uh, more where they came from, and more and more locals and farmers are showing their private artifact collection. But see, and part of it will make you feel like, okay, well, maybe this shit's hokey, because it just seems way too on the nose. Uh, but recently, and I don't have an article for it specifically, there was um, something about them linking. I might have talked about this last episode, uh, talking about how we found out that we were up in Africa uh, migrating to there or from there a couple it, it's, it always seems like like we're an extra 2,000 years behind like we're taking little and little and little uh, each time to find out that you know we were from a different time or origination so it, it's, it's funny how um, the I don't know the idea or the theory of where we might have sparked from 
He's getting pushed back and pushed back. And then seeing that there was later times of, uh, of us migrating, might have given different reasons um, for whatever, maybe also adding other elements that we could that were definitely missing as far as what tragic shits could have popped off that made us go the route that we went to. So all of it, very fucking interesting. Um, most certainly wish that I had my partner to be able to speak to this on because I'm wondering at, at what point we're just going to have contact and, or we're going to become more apparent. And um, I don't know. I don't know if we're all worthy to be able to, to speak on it, to be of it. To, uh, I mean, I have no idea. And it kind of makes me just scared to even want to think of uh, possibilities. It's because they're listening. they watching. You know what I'm saying? Like, think of um, Genesis and the very beginning of the Old Testament and about how, you know, Adam and Eve, they're fucking naked. All they're, they're, they're hiding behind is a fucking bush. What the fuck is a bush to technology? All right, so if that's the major shit yourself, uh, then this next culinary uh, secret will. Uh, scientists have found a potential food source for astronauts using microbes to convert human waste into more like food. Now, according to the British online newspaper, The Independent, researchers at Pennsylvania State outlined a method to break down solid and liquid waste for producing protein and fat-rich substance that human waste, uh, oh, sorry, from human waste. All that shit came from human waste. From the shit came the shit. Now, the study was published uh, in that Life Journal of Science and Space Research, uh, but they quoted and saying that they envisioned and tested the concept of simultaneously treating astronauts while waste with microbes while producing a biomass that is edible either directly or indirectly. And depending on safety concerns, uh, I guess is what allowed them to, to do their shit. Now, it's a little strange, though, but the concept would be a little bit like marm-like, uh, marmite, what the fuck do you say it, or Vegemite? Uh, they're, it's pretty much eating a smear of microbial goo. So I don't know if that just makes your shit diarrhea automatically or if you have to get that substance from diarrhea. Uh, but anyways, this is that quoting from that uh, professor. And they're saying that food supply is a major hurdle when planning lengthy space flights and recycling waste into nutritious food is one solution to the problem. Now, according to the House of his colleagues, the method involves uh, anaerobic digestion. Uh, the fuck that is it's a process that first to the breakdown of materials materials uh to the absence of oxygen speaking of fucking oxygen i've been smoking it's fucking early goddamn morning i'm blaming my retardedness on how late it's been taking me to do this my apologies but uh, either which way um it's considered an efficient way of breaking down biodegradable matter and researchers uh, said that while their method is not ready for application yet provides a new model for creating food on board a spacecraft so imagine if someone were to fine-tune our system you can get 85 percent of carbon and hydrogen back from the waste into protein without having to use hydroponics or artificial light uh yeah sure bazinga big feel is due to flip and is showing signs of shifting at a rate of 5% every century. Now, I know I talked about this uh, last week, but a full reversal could happen in 2,000 years, and we really don't fucking know sometimes where the fuck we at, and no, maybe what, I don't know. I feel like there's so many time lapse in each other that who knows if we're skipping shit, if that makes any sense. Anyways, uh, they're saying it's usually with the north and south magnetic poles to flip over the course of the planet's history. And for the past 20 million years, the pattern of pole reversals take place every 200,000 to 300,000 years. And the last time a full reversal took place was approximately 780,000 years ago based on paleomagnetic research. And between swaps, the poles sometimes attempt to flip and then go back to its original position. So the European Space Agency said that Earth's poles are preparing for a shift and the impacts could be devastating. 
Now, what are magnetic fields for? I mean, again, because I always take it back to, I don't know, most recently imagining uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. They're fucking going through these landmines and they'd be able to, uh, they could be totally fucked if, they, you know, they go over the wrong thing or just by being too close in general. And it says that we're aware of north and south geographic poles on the Earth and the two other poles looping out of them, known as the geomagnetic uh, poles of the planet. Now, these magnetic fields originate from magnetic dip poles, which are uh, swirly magnetic currents of molten iron located deep in the Earth's core. And the Earth, or, or the fields extend more than, you know, 10 Earth uh, radii. Or 63.7 orbit, or 384.4 million meters on the opposite side. Now, most of the field is generated at depths greater than 3,000 kilometers uh, by the movement of molten iron in its outer core. The remaining 6% is partly due to electrical currents in space surrounding Earth and partially due to the magnetic rocks in the upper uh, lithosphere. And the rigid outer part of the Earth consisting of the crust and upper uh, mantle. Now, the magnetic fields predict the planet from high levels of uh, change particles and solar and cosmetic radiation. Uh, for example, ultraviolet rays in the ozone layer and uh, solar rays in the sun do not hit us directly because the Earth's magnetic fields deflect them and force them to move around. So again, kind of like real, recognize real, and then other shits will just kind of just keep each other away at its utmost. Anyways, um, while full pole switch is not due anytime soon or in this lifetime, I mean, the possibility of its occurrence could lead to devastating results or either render parts of the planet in inhabitable. Uh, and when the poles flip, or at least try to flip the per, uh, proactive shields, are weakened by at least 10 times the normal uh, proactive capability. And when this happens, increased levels of radiation will reach the surface of Earth. Now, changed particles can also interfere with satellites, um, aviation, and ground-based electronical infrastructures. And uh, a weakened uh, magnetic field will also likely impact orbiting satellites. So the switching process can also expose the entire planet to radiation for centuries. And scientists have tried to link potential pole shifts uh, to the mass extinction uh, of species of Earth. So again, I don't know. I don't think it will. I don't know if uh, if there's any way that we can ever uh, pass through loops, or it's just a matter of time. And again, who knows who's to know the calculation of shits or where black holes will push us through. Kaboy. I say all that to say that galaxies that move together have uh, cosmologists stumped about dark matter and, and what its effects can be. Now, astronomers have discovered that the smaller satellite galaxies around Centaurus A and are engaged in a coordinated dance that seems out of sync with the understanding of large-scale structures of the universe. Now, this discovery, described in the Journal of Science, could push phys uh, physici uh, physics, phys was it physicists, 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 motherfucker, you know what I'm trying to say, physicists, uh, to redefine our understanding of dark matter and that the mysterious stuff that forms the universe cosmic web. Now, unlike normal matter, dark matter doesn't interact with the other matter. It can't be seen or touched, and yet we know that it must be there because there's so much of it that its gravitational influence affect the spinning of galaxies. Spinning of galaxies. Now, there's a more than, than a five times as much dark matter as there is normal matter. Normal matter being the stuff that makes up the stars, the galaxies, Earth, and everything that inhabits it. And there are lots of theories explained, or to explain what matter is, or what dark matter is, I should say. But currently, uh, this prevailing idea is that cold, old dark matter, or I'm sorry, just cold dark matter forms giant clumps connected by dark matter uh, filaments in a cosmic web, literally. And large galaxies like the Milky Way are surrounded by large spheres or halos of dark matter. And these galaxies also typically um, have a sizable uh, 
quarter area of smaller satellite galaxies around them. And according to our understanding of dark matter, those satellite galaxies should be distributed around uh, their galactic host. Uh, said study co-author Marcel Palowski, an astrophysicist at uh, astrophysicist at the University of California, in Irvine. Now uh, he said that that they should be rather randomly distributed, or uh, yeah, dis- yeah, distributed and uh, move in more or less random directions if we believe our current understanding of cosmology. Um, but, I mean, they, they, they don't really. Uh, apparently, they seem to take our home galaxy, the Milky Way, out of 11 satellite galaxies with well-known velocities, eight seem to be orbiting a tight disk that is perpendicular to the plane of the spiral galaxy. And there could be more galaxies, it's just we just can't see them again, fucking the dark matter and whatnot. And some patterns seem to apply to a number of the satellites around other galactic neighbors. Andromeda and 15 out of 27 surveyed galaxies are arranged in a narrow plane around a host galaxy. Now, uh, many scientists figure that the Milky Way and uh, Andromeda uh, must be an exception rather than the rule. I was saying that uh, many astronomers have been concerned about drawing conclusions to the nearest galaxy system, and uh, the census of Milky Way satellite galaxies might be affected by the gas and stars in the galaxy's disk. And it's not um, currently possible to gesture motion uh, perpendicular to the plane of the satellites in Andromeda, meaning that its long-term stability remains unknown. And uh, what else? Well, it says here that um, they looked into normal neighborhoods, but they focused on the galaxy Centaurus A, which lies about 13 million light years away. And Centaurus A, uh, an elliptical galaxy that also surrounded by the array of satellites, whether the Milky Way, um, well, wasn't it the exception or, or the rule? And it should remains to be um, figured out. If that makes any fucking sense or sounds confusing, fret not, because we're going to take this motherfucker real Old Testament style and make a sacrifice. Uh, that's right, give pleasant smell to the gods. May they take pleasure in what we give. And may it, I don't know, allure them or trick them or get them to pass the fuck out so we can jump into the spaceship and get the fuck out of this galaxy. However it is, whatever it is, whether you're Muslim, whether you, um, what's the word, third world country indigenous, get ready for some motherfucking... These are the dedications. Yo, and I'm gonna get right into it, because she is just all around adorable, beautiful, perfect pixie cut. Wedita. And you can find her online, whether on IG or on Twitter, at What's Your Sign. So that's What's underscore you are underscore sign. And you can see her. Um, she came across me like a, like a beautiful little bitch in the back of a milk carton. And by that very same standard as well. Uh, this uh, chick known as Becca Martinez, a 22-year-old nanny who lives in L.A., I uh, made headlines for her 14-year-old difference uh, with the lead guy, uh, Ari Luyendijk, Luyendijk Jr. I'm not too fucking sure. But again, she's a standout pixie-cut goddess. And uh, she's making the waves uh, for something entirely different, though, besides her being on the fucking show. Uh, it was because she, she was uh, recently removed from a missing persons list in California uh, after someone had recognized her from the show, all thanks to a local news report. And I guess this is how it went down when a posting uh, its cover story on to Facebook this week, the North Coast Journal asked its readers if it recognized any of the 35 people that were listed on the missing from Humboldt County on the California Department of Justice website. Somebody did, and they pointed to Martinez's image. After comparing some of Martinez's Instagram photos to some of her missing persons photos, they realized that they appeared quite similar. And the publication reached out to the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office. The call prompted the deputy who initially took Martinez's missing persons report to reach out to her on Thursday via cell phone number they had on file. 
And after speaking to Martinez, the deputy confirmed that she was indeed not missing and she was removed from the list. And if you can see here, she was perfectly emo, still had the little bitty hair, looked real free spirited. Now, of course, just a commercially uh, bombshell. Um, and yeah, this shit just, I don't know why, why it took me by so much. And I hate those reality shows. I really don't know what to think about the people who put themselves on there and showcase themselves in that way. And it makes me wonder whether any of these bitches kind of suck his dick on the low, or if they really do try to, you know, put up, um, you know, I don't say a fight, but to, you know, play hard to, to, to really play the game to make them fall. So I don't know. I don't know exactly how it works. I don't want you want to watch videos to kind of detour the beautiful image that has been created in my mind. Um, but yeah, y'all take a look at it, and again, y'all can visit her site. Uh, our, our social medias and to, to see further much more of and she just seems like perfectly 80s like there's just a, a certain point from the 80s before it made its transition and I think that's just where, where she lies at I don't know I could um, just be uh, too hammer stuck on uh, certain stereotypes but I think she's fucking adorable and I'll probably get in trouble for saying that. Mm-hmm. Yo, it's been a pleasure talking at you. I'm going to definitely have to wrap this motherfucker up. So I definitely wanted to let y'all know that I appreciate if y'all have been sitting, walking, strolling, doing what have you with me as I've been talking at you, sharing stories with you. Um, again, if you ever wanted to reach me, you can always reach me at so Bopo, that's S-O-U-L. P-A-P-O on most social medias. For example, you can go to soapopple.tumblr.com. Shit, you can go to IG at soapopple, Twitter at soapopple. Do what have you as long as you got to. And, uh, of course, if you ever want to become a producer of the show, you can always go to www.patreon.com slash soapopple. Again, that's S-O-U-L-P-A-P-O. Motherfucker, you can even add it at Gmail and reach me at that motherfucker if you so uh, wanted to. Um, but, again... Crazy fucking week, crazy little bit of details. I hope you get to enjoy yourself. I hope you get to be inspired. I hope that you get to, again, do what you do because only you can do it the best. And um, just like the dedication, uh, Becca M, being so beautiful, being so just perfect, held this little thing in, uh, that we're going to call the wall of dedications to live forever and beyond. Um, I saw an obituary that caught my eye, and I'm pretty sure y'all might have heard if y'all do the uh, Facebook nonsenses, because I heard it was, it was shared heavy on there. Uh, but his name is Terry Ward uh, from Demo, Indiana. Not to be confused with the city that had the little pedophile 18 year old at the very beginning of the show. Uh, but Mr. Terry Wayne Ward, age 71, of Demo, Indiana, escaped this mortal realm. On Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018, leaving behind uh, 32 jars of Miracle Whip, 17 boxes of Hamburger Helper, and multitudes of other random items that will prove helpful in the event of a zombie apocalypse. Terry is survived by his overly patient and accepting wife, Kathy, who was the love of his life. Uh, in fact, she gladly accepted sympathy for it during their 48 years of marriage. He's also survived by daughters Rebecca, uh, Hines and Jean, uh, Liam, sister Linda, brother Phil, grandchildren Alexander and Hannah Hines, known as the Mesmotopians, uh, Daphne and, and uh, Aaron Pastillo, known as uh, the Daffer and Peanut, Brendan and Owen Lamb, known as uh, Venus and Herb, and Teresa McCurry, known as Smiley. He is preceded in death by his parents, Paul and Bernice Ward, daughter, Laura Pestillo, uh, grandson, Vincent Pestillo, brother, Kenneth Ward, uh, 1972 Rambler, and a hip. Terry uh, graduated from Thornbridge High School in South Holland, Illinois, where only three of his teachers took an early retirement after having him as a student and he met the love of his life Kathy by telling her he was a lineman he didn't specify early on that he was a lineman for the phone company not the NFL still Kathy and Terry wed in the fall of 69 uh, perfectly between the summer of love and the winter of regret 
Terry volunteered his services with the U.S. Uh, States, uh, United States Army and was an active combat veteran in the Vietnam War. He retired from AT&T, formerly Ameritech, formerly Indiana Bell, after 39 years of begrudging service, where he accumulated roughly 3,000 rolls of black electrical tape during the course of his career, which he used for everything from open wounds to don't use this button covers. He enjoyed many, many things. Among those things were hunting, fishing, golfing, snorkeling, ABBA, hiking turkey run, uh, chopping wood, shooting guns, Bed Bath & Beyond, Starlight Mints, Cold Beer, Free Beer, The History Channel, CCCR, War Movies, Discussing Who Makes the Best Pizza, The Chicago White Sox, Go Southside, Old Buicks, and above all, his family. He was renowned distributor of popsicles and ice cream uh, sandwiches to his grandchildren. He also turned on programs such as Phoenix and Herb for his grand youngins, usually when they were actually there. He described uppity foods like hummus, which his family lovingly called bean dip for his benefit, which he loved consequently, and he couldn't have, uh, was it? He couldn't give a damn about most material things. And automobiles were never to be purchased new. He never owned a personal cell phone and had zero working knowledge of the Kardashians. Uh, Terry died knowing that the Blues Brothers was the best movie, uh, Young. Uh, Clint Eastwood was the baddest man on earth. And hot sauce can be added on absolutely anything. Uh, tremendous and heartfelt thanks go to the truly exceptional nurses at South Lake Methodist Hospital Neuro Intensive Care Unit, who provided much more than nursing care for Terry, but also provided peaceful and compassionate environments during his transition from this life to the next. Friends can visit the family on Saturday, and it gives the kind of directions and everything of where they're at. It's a funeral home, pretty much. And saying the memorial donations in Terry's name can be made to your favorite charity or favorite watering home, where you are instructed to tie a few on and tell a few stories of the great Terry Ward. If we can ever be so fucking lucky to live such a happy life, may we be remembered in such a happy way. God bless you guys. And in all uh, respective intensive purposes, I came. Fuck you! Twenty years, not once have you thrown a woman my way. You don't think we like cheating on our wives too? And you never once paid for drugs. Not once. You pay that that chimp more than you pay us. I had to borrow from the chimp to get a mortgage on my house. And those stupid Siamese glass cats you get us every year for Christmas. I don't want any more Siamese glass cats. The Siamese cat is a symbol of nobility in ancient Egypt. Fuck nobility. Fuck ancient Egypt. Fuck cats. And you never paid for drugs. Not once. You slept with my wife. You slept with me too. And I've had confused feelings about that for 10 years now. And you never once paid for drugs. Not once. You're on your own, Dewey Cox. We're leaving. Well, I guess this is the end of a chapter in your life, Dewey Cox. Don't forget, love loves you.